Hey guys, Q here. In this video, I'll be breaking down the final episodes of Better Call Saul Season 6 and ranking them in a tier list, including Season 6 Episode 8 to the Season Finale, Season 6 Episode 13. This is technically part 2 to my Season 6 retrospective, but feel free to use this as a jumping off point even if you haven't seen Part 1. Warning is spoilers for all of Better Call Saul, along with Breaking Bad and El Camino. With that being said, let's first hear a word from today's sponsor. Since my channel has recently been mainly dedicated to Better Call Saul, I've had to learn a lot about US law over the years while researching various topics for the show. Due to this, I feel like today's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan, is an incredibly suitable and relevant company to partner with for the channel. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm. They have over 100 offices across the country, more than 800 lawyers, and 4,000 case staff ready to fight for you. The best part about working with Morgan & Morgan? You pay nothing up front for their services. Everything is completely free of charge unless they win your case. No upfront costs and no sign-up fees. All the paperwork, research, expert witnesses, negotiatings, court hearings, it's all free unless they win. If you don't win your case, you pay nothing. People are often afraid to sue because they feel bad. When you sue for an injury, you're not suing the person who caused the injury, you're suing their insurance company who's sitting on billions of dollars. There's no reason to feel bad for getting the compensation you deserve. Morgan Morgan has attorneys who focus on every area of personal injury law. Car accidents, a slip and fall, workplace injuries, medical malpractice, nursing home abuse, and more. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless they win. For more information, go to freethepeople.com slash thevividkiwi or dial pound law pound 529 from your cell phone. Morgan & Morgan will fight to get you the best results. So although this wasn't any Saul Goodman commercial, I still find it really fun to be sponsored by an actual law firm for a Better Call Saul video. Thank you to Morgan & Morgan for supporting the channel by sponsoring the video and speaking Speaking of which, let's jump right into it. Season 6 Episode 8, Point and Shoot This episode starts with an incredibly ominous flash forward of Howard's car isolated on a beach with both his wallet and wedding ring methodically placed on the dash. The cold open starts with one of his shoes being washed to shore, followed by the other shoe halfway down the beach. This is foreshadowing for the cover-up story for Howard's death, but we'll discuss that more later in the episode, as this is yet another one of those mysterious cold opens this season that doesn't necessarily make sense at first, but will by the time you finish the entire episode. What I will say right now, though, is the fact that we see this at the beginning of 608 immediately after Howard's death at the end of 607 just makes it hit that much harder, even after the month and a half mid-season break. Speaking of which, this this episode acts as the unintentional mid-season premiere. They never originally intended to split the final season in half, but delays involving the pandemic and Bob Odenkirk's heart attack understandably pushed the season back and forced them to air season 6 in two parts just so they'd have enough time to finish filming and editing all the episodes. Now after the intro sequence, we cut right back to the situation at Kim's apartment, but first with some gruesome establishing shots that I really like and appreciate. Better Call Saul is well known for its amazing cinematography, with these establishing shots being a perfect example of it so let's discuss them in depth for just a moment. First, we see a candle flicker with Howard's blood all over it, which is the conclusion to this candle's own mini symbolic arc. If you've seen my other videos surrounding episodes 607 and 608, you already know that I love the candle symbolism and here's why. It first flickered in 607 when Howard arrived at the apartment due to opening the door, causing a shift in the air pressure in the room, which in itself was foreshadowing the same thing happening again moments later when Lalo arrived. And as we know, Howard plus Lalo in the same room equals Howard being killed by Lalo, which is implied by the blood being splattered all over the candle. The creators even used the candle for multiple promotional posters for the final season, first as the 607 teaser image, followed by using the bloody candle as the image recognizing and congratulating Tom Schnoz for being nominated for Outstanding Writing of a Drama Series for Episode 607. But moving on, slowly but surely, the next establishing shot shows Howard's blood also splattered all over one of the paintings on Kim's wall, which as you may know, is the same painting that Jimmy and Kim secretly have their con board sticky notes on the back of, creating another symbolic tragedy due to the fact that Howard was killed as a result of their schemes against him, which was an unintended consequence they never could have imagined happening, and it's even more dark when you realize that Saul kept this painting as it was in his Breaking Bad mansion. Jimmy and Kim knew that ruining Howard's reputation would cause him struggles, with the question of how much their schemes against him would truly hurt him being an ongoing theme all season long ever since the season 5 finale cliffhanger, debating on how much it truly burned Howard to the ground. Jimmy warned Kim that he may get burned so hard he may never be able to practice law again, but Kim kept downplaying it by stating it as one minor career setback. Even up to Howard's final moments, they all agreed that Howard would eventually land on his feet, implying that although they hurt him, it wouldn't be permanent. Oh how wrong they all were, considering that it actually caused Howard to be murdered by Lalo, obviously 
being the worst and most permanent outcome imaginable. One final mention I want to make about the establishing shots is how Lalo's theme starts once again playing as the score in the background, which is the perfect payoff considering it's the same track that played all the way back in episode 509 when Lalo first questioned Jimmy and Kim in their apartment, along with playing again when Lalo arrived behind Howard in 607, with 608 now being a direct continuation of that. Here you go. I just want to hear the story. How? Ever since 509, the threat of Lalo potentially killing someone without a second thought was always looming over these characters, and now it's finally come to fruition. Once again, shout out to Dave Porter for creating an equally iconic soundtrack for Better Call Saul that he did with Breaking Bad. Now, as the establishing shots finish setting the stage with Howard's blood covering everything and draining from his body as he lies lifeless on the floor, we finally hear what Lalo wanted to talk to Jimmy and Kim about as he forces them to sit down on the couch and listen. The way that Jimmy and Kim have to traumatically tiptoe over Howard Howard's dead body in order to even get to the couch is such a nice touch showing how much shock and adrenaline is currently rushing through their bodies. Speaking of which, let's analyze the way that Jimmy and Kim are both handling the current situation in their own separate ways. While Kim is just shaking in fear, Jimmy's head is already running a mile a minute as he instantly tries talking them out of the situation. Lalo's always known Saul as the guy with a big mouth due to Saul's way with words allowing him to talk himself out of almost every situation ever since the first two episodes of the show. But here Lalo gets him to shut up and informs him that he's done enough talking and that now it's time for him to listen. Now, in regard to Kim's reaction to the situation, however, I want to highlight how brilliant of a job Ray Seahorn does playing up Kim's fear in this moment by showing her constantly shaking and stuttering. It's incredibly realistic and just makes her reaction to Howard's death just that much more believable. Whenever I watch Howard's death scene in 607, I always praise Jimmy and Kim's realistic reactions to it, with Kim shaking in fear in 608 being an amazing continuation of exactly that. Now, as Lalo gives Jimmy orders to go to Gus's house to kill him, the way that Lalo is so casual about it is just completely menacing. This is why we all love Lalo's character so much though, since he's always the most charismatic guy on screen and can flip a switch in his head between being the life of the party to a cold-hearted killer and then back again so instantly that it's just so incredibly terrifying. I'm sure Saul appreciates people getting down to brass tacks more than anyone else, but it's just the fact that Lalo doesn't even give a second thought about killing Howard that's so evil. To Jimmy, Kim, and the audience, Howard is an incredibly important person and character, but to Lalo, Howard was just a fly that needed to be swatted, nothing more. When Lalo kills someone, he's so matter-of-fact about it, as it clearly doesn't bother him the way it would others due to being raised as a Salamanca. As Lalo explains the plan that he has for Jimmy, when he mentions that he left a camera and a gun for Jimmy in the glove box, I love the total disconnect between Jimmy and Lalo in this moment. When Lalo hears Jimmy's surprise about having to use a gun for his plan, he just informs Jimmy that the gun is idiot-proof and that it's already loaded and has no safety, when in reality, Jimmy is shocked about the idea of having to use a gun in general. General. As Lalo explains to Jimmy to point and shoot the gun at the person who answers the door, Lalo obviously name drops the name of the episode, which is ironic considering that the actual pointing and shooting of a gun later in the episode will actually be aimed at Lalo, but more on that in a moment. So Lalo never mentions Gus as a target by name, but when he tries to coerce Jimmy into killing someone, he downplays the idea of murder by stating how easy it'll be due to describing Gus's likeness as looking like an innocent librarian. Lalo's trying to paint the idea of an easy target, but the idea of killing a harmless, defenseless librarian just makes it that much worse in my opinion. Lalo doesn't even seem to understand that they'd have troubles committing murder since it's so easy for him, so he instead thinks that the potential threat level is the hiccup. Although Lalo is describing Gus to Jimmy here, it's important to note that Kim is also taking all this information in as she is the one who will eventually end up going in Jimmy's place. Lalo then name drops the title of the episode a second time, telling Jimmy to use the camera to take a photo of Gus's dead body as proof that he's dead. Lalo tells Jimmy that it should take him about an hour round trip to get the deed done and that he'll be waiting at the apartment with Kim for Jimmy to return with the proof on the camera. The subtext to this of course is Lalo implying that he'll be keeping Kim as a hostage to make sure that that Jimmy does what he wants and that 
that if Jimmy doesn't, he'll kill Kim. While Olive says this, Jimmy cuts him off by saying how he should send Kim in his place, which can be taken as two different interpretations. First, it may initially seem cowardly to want Kim to go kill someone for Lalo instead of himself, as if Jimmy's trying to weasel his way out of it, but on the other hand, Jimmy's actually doing this because he figures that whoever gets left in the apartment with Lalo will be killed. Lalo just implied to him that he'd keep Kim alive as long as Jimmy does the murder and returns with the proof, but Jimmy seems to think that this is a lie and thinks that the person left with Lalo will be killed regardless, and even if they aren't, the person that stays behind is the one still in immediate danger. Jimmy obviously thinks this due to just seeing Howard killed right in front of him, so he's trying to get Kim out of danger in general. Thinking back to the 509 Lalo confrontation, Jimmy repeatedly tried allowing Lalo to excuse Kim from the room, but to no avail. So likewise, it makes sense that Jimmy's first instinct would be to get Kim out of any semblance of danger, regardless of the potential outcomes and variables. It's also possible that Jimmy thinks that neither he nor Kim will be able to go through with the murder that Lalo's requesting, which essentially gives him the ultimatum of one of them being able to escape and flee, while the other one will be left there and killed due to the person fleeing not going through with doing said murder and returning with the proof. I love the way that Kim quietly begs Jimmy to stop talking as he's trying to convince Lalo to send her instead of himself, again continuing Ray Seahorn's brilliant portrayal of Kim's fear in the scene that I mentioned earlier. Lalo even notices this, stating how he's unsure if she'll stick to the plan due to the way that she's shaken up about the whole situation, but Jimmy reassures him that she will. After a bunch of bickering back and forth between Jimmy and Kim debating who should go, Lalo ends up brushing them off and agreeing that Kim should go in order to just shut them up. Lalo doesn't truly care who goes, as his plan to send one of them to kill Gus is actually red herring for Gus and Mike. Although it'd be nice for Lalo if Jimmy and Kim actually do manage to kill Gus and succeed in the plan, Lalo doubts that they'll truly succeed and instead only wants to send one of them as a distraction for Gus and Mike to further solidify Lalo's misdirection. If you remember in 607, after Lalo accidentally let Gus and Mike know that he was still alive by calling Hector at Casa Tranquila, Lalo then called back to use this to his advantage to make Gus and Mike think that he'd be attacking Gus's house that night. So, sending Jimmy and Kim to kill Gus is to further this bluff that Gus's house will be attacked in order to distract them and keep them busy, while Lalo executes his real plan, which we'll see later on in the episode. As Kim reluctantly goes to leave, she's so shaken up that she even forgets to put on her shoes, which Lalo points out. With Kim now gone, Lalo ponders what to do with Jimmy, with Jimmy thinking that he's about to be killed. Instead, Lalo starts tying Jimmy to a chair, and I love the cinematic shot of the camera being mounted on the chair as Lalo pulls it up for Jimmy. It reminds me a lot of the shot from 604, the camera being mounted on the door to Howard's car, as Jimmy opens and closes it to put a cone in Howard's parking spot. As Lalo ties up Jimmy, he explains to Jimmy what happened to him in the season 5 finale in regard to the failed assassination attempt against him down in Mexico. Lalo states that he thinks Nacho is the one who double-crossed him, and implies that since Lalo met Saul through Nacho, that Saul isn't trustworthy either. Although Saul wasn't actively part of taking down Lalo, he has been adjacent to it due to being affiliated with Mike. Saul only got Lalo out of prison due to Mike's information, and only survived bringing Lalo's bail money back due to Mike saving him in order to make sure that Lalo got out of prison. Jimmy never helped orchestrate the assassination attempt, but he did become vaguely aware of it, along with Mike and his employer working against Lalo to get him killed. In 509, before Lalo confronted Jimmy and Kim at their apartment, Jimmy realized while speaking to Mike in Mike's car that Mike's employer has the intention to kill Lalo now that he's out of prison. Then, after Lalo confronted Jimmy and Kim in their apartment, Jimmy did eventually get vague confirmation from Mike in the season 5 finale that Mike's employer would kill Lalo. Due to this, Jimmy obviously thought that Lalo was dead this whole time, which is why he's so surprised to see that Lalo's still alive, with him now hearing the full story of what happened to Lalo and how he survived during the season 5 finale firsthand. Although Lalo is accusing Saul of being in cahoots with Nacho, this is most likely just to scare the crap out of Jimmy, and it works, continuing to add to Jimmy's trauma from the whole situation, which he'll have to deal with for the rest of his life. As Lalo gags Jimmy, we can hear him saying the iconic it wasn't me, it was Ignacio line, giving a wonderful full circle moment to that original Breaking Bad scene which sparked the creation of Lalo and Nacho's characters in the first place. Lalo turning up the TV and gagging Jimmy is not only to get Jimmy to stay quiet so this crime scene won't be discovered, but it's also subtext of Lalo effectively neutering Jimmy's superpower, which is his big mouth that Lalo has known him for. Also, I can't remember if I mentioned this during my Season 6 Part 1 tier list, although I'm pretty sure I mentioned it in previous videos about 608, but the black and white movie that Jimmy and Kim were watching is called Born Yesterday. It's about a woman being told by her lawyer to marry her sugar daddy due to the fact that a wife cannot be forced to 
testify against her husband, which sounds a lot like the reason why Jimmy and Kim got married in season 5. Now, although the black and white movies that Jimmy and Kim always watch do definitely relate to the story of the show, such as watching His Girl Friday in episode 509, usually these films are just actually selected from a list of pre-existing royalty-free movies for the creators to use without any cost. Due to this, when the creators get questioned about these movies that Jimmy and Kim watch, they just state that there isn't actually much of a deeper meaning to them, and that they just chose what they're allowed to. That being said, all things considered, it's crazy how they're able to pick certain movies from their royalty-free catalog that actually do directly relate to the story of Better Call Saul. Anyways, Lalo leaves Jimmy alone in the apartment, tied up and gagged to the chair, with Jimmy freaking out about it so much that when he rocks himself back and forth, he actually falls over right beside Howard's body, now forced to stare at him. It's kind of poetic the way that Jimmy is parallel to Howard's dead body in this uh, top-down shot, but it's also kind of funny how Jimmy trying to get himself out of the situation just made it even worse. Jimmy being forced to stare at Howard's body gives him time to think about the actions that he's done which have directly caused Howard's death, along with the situation that he's in in general. In this moment, I wouldn't be surprised if Jimmy wished he was dead too, as he thought Lalo was about to kill him. This show has a way of giving characters the worst fates possible. When it comes to innocent characters such as Howard, unrightfully being killed is the worst fate, but for characters like Jimmy or Kim who have sins to atone for, the show manages to find fates that are even worse than death for them. We see Kim driving to Gus's house to complete the mission that Lalo is forced upon her, and again we see Ray Seahorn's brilliant acting this episode portraying the shock and fear Kim has as she's most likely in denial about the situation that she's even currently in. As Kim stops at a set of lights, some police pull up beside her in the other lane, giving us tension wondering if Kim is going to speak out to them or not. She even rolls down her window considering it, but decides against it as it would sadly only worsen her situation. Not only would she have to come clean about their involvement with Lalo, but they'd also have to come clean with what Howard was doing at their apartment along with his death. And since Kim doesn't know that Lalo has left the apartment already, she's unaware that he wouldn't get caught or be arrested. And even if Lalo was still there with Jimmy, it would just result in a standoff with Jimmy being used as a hostage, possibly endangering his life even more so. Now as Kim arrives at Gus's house, it's crazy how much tension the show is able to bring into this scene, even though we're all aware that there's no way Kim will actually kill Gus. Not only are we aware of the fact that Gus has a body double living in his house, but that he also has his entire house and surrounding neighborhood constantly monitored monitored by security cameras so they'd see her coming a mile away, you know, and also along with the fact that Gus has to survive in order to be in Breaking Bad. That being said, since we weren't aware of Kim's fate at the time of this episode airing, it was still questionable whether or not she'd be somehow killed for attempting what Lalo is forcing her to do. Plus, just the fact that Kim is even willing to go through with the potential murder in the first place is wild. The look on Kim's face while she accepts what she's about to do reminds me a lot of Gail opening the door to find Jesse pointing a gun at him. I also really like the parallel of both Kim and Walt at one point walking up to Gus's house in Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad respectively. Now, the audience wondered just as much as Lalo if Kim would stick to the plan, and it appears that she was fully willing to go through with it, that is until Mike sneak attacks her from behind and pushes her into the house to interrogate her on what she's doing there. Gus watches from his safe house as Mike questions Kim, with Kim admitting that Lalo is at her apartment and that she was sent to kill a man who looks exactly like Gus. What makes this even more interesting is since she doesn't know Gus by name or face, she thinks that Gus's body double is the man that she was sent to kill due to Lalo's previous description of Gus back at the apartment. Although Kim doesn't know that her true target was Gus, it's enough for Gus and Mike to realize that Lalo had definitely sent Kim to kill Gus. This may all seem kind of redundant to mention out loud due to how obvious it is, but I still find it incredibly interesting how Gus's body double did come into play in some sort of way. I also love the way that Mike tries to calm Kim down to speak to her while also being shocked by what Kim is saying at the same time. This whole Mike-Kim dynamic during this scene is just so intriguing, with both actors doing a brilliant job portraying their reactions in an incredibly realistic and genuine manner. Plus, once Mike assures Kim that he'll handle the situation, I love the way that Kim lashes out at him wondering where he was as he had previously told her that he had men watching her and Jimmy on the off chance that Lala would confront them again. Mike realizes in this moment that he messed up recalling his men from local priority targets, since the most improbable and unexpected spot for Lalo to pop up is actually exactly where he did. This is just yet another example of Mike underestimating Lalo in the 4D chess that he's playing, which once again shows why Lalo is such an admirable adversary for Gus. Mike, however, doesn't have any time to linger on his mistake or apologize to Kim for not being there, as she told them that they only have about 20 minutes to return to the apartment before Lalo kills Jimmy over Kim not doing what he asked her to. Mike marches over to Gus in the safe house to tell him to stay put while Mike 
handles it, but Gus seems to have the perception to see through the plan that Lalo has laid out. It could be due to him thinking that it's reckless for Lalo to send some random woman to assassinate him, causing him to realize that this is all just a distraction, and or it could be due to the fact that he doesn't want to just blindly follow Mike's orders and let Mike handle the situation on his own, since Mike has made multiple mistakes not only with this Lalo situation, like just now, but even in the past, such as vouching for Werner. As Gus ponders the situation, he feels like it's worth questioning Kim himself, so he calls Victor in order to speak to Kim directly over the phone, giving us the only time that Gus and Kim ever speak to each other on the show. Gus asks Kim why Lalo sent him, causing Kim to admit that Lalo originally wanted to send Jimmy, but that Jimmy talked him out of it. During my initial viewing, I wondered if this was Gus realizing the superpower of Jimmy being able to use his big mouth to talk himself out of any situation, but since Gus never outright uses Jimmy's big mouth superpowers for anything in the future, that's clearly not the case. What's actually going through Gus's head here is the fact that Gus is surprised that Lalo is able to be talked out of anything. What I mean by this is Lalo being easily persuaded to send Kim instead of Jimmy, tells Gus that Lalo didn't care who went because this wasn't even Lalo's true plan to begin with, confirming Gus's suspicions that this is all just a distraction. This is why Gus hung up on Kim continuing to explain the situation, as that was all that Gus needed to know. Also as a side note to further gush over the amazing cinematography of this show, I do love the way that we only see Kim on the screen of Gus's monitor while he speaks to her, giving a big CCTV vibe. Since Mike ordered Tyrus to bring his men to the apartment to help with Lalo and Jimmy, it's now left the laundromat mostly on guarded even more so than before, which is exactly what Lalo truly wanted. Lalo's plan was always to infiltrate the laundromat and get proof for Donald Audio that Gus was working against the cartel's interests, but ever since he accidentally revealed to Gus and Mike that he was still alive, he's been using it to his advantage in order to lure more and more guards away from the laundromat. Lalo outing himself still being alive to Gus and Mike actually worked in his favor, as there were far more guards at the laundromat than he had anticipated, so if he did go through with his original plan to just blindly go in guns a blazing, he would have been easily outnumbered. But since he used outing himself to his advantage, he caused Mike to pull most of his men off of other targets in order to fortify Gus's house. This not only pulled Mike and some of his men away from the laundromat, which Lalo witnessed in 607, but also pulled Mike's men away from Jimmy and Kim, allowing Lalo to confront them and use them to further his plans. By using Jimmy and Kim as yet another distraction to further solidify his fake plans to attack Gus's house, Lalo has now tricked Mike into pulling Tyrus and his crew away from the laundromat as well, now only leaving leaving one man there left to watch over the security cameras. Talk about creating a positive out of a bad situation. Since there's only one man left at the laundromat, Lalo is able to sneak in through a ventilation fan without being noticed. Now back at the apartments, Mike has one of his men in the same spot that he once was in 509 overwatching the apartment window with a sniper, while even more of his men hold the perimeter. Even though Mike is most likely the best sniper out of all of his men, he wanted to be able to confront Lalo in the apartment himself. Sadly, this never happens though as Lalo is already long gone by the time that Mike busts through the door. Jimmy tells Mike that he doesn't know where Lalo went, but that he left right after Kim did, causing Mike to realize that Kim was just a distraction and that Mike walked right into it. This is now the second time that Mike has made a mistake in a row, and he tries to call Gus to inform him, but it's too late as Gus was already one step ahead of him and decided to confront Lalo on his own. Gus made the three men that Mike left with him drive him to the laundromat, with the lone man watching the security footage letting them in. As Gus analyzes the inside of the laundromat, he notices that the ventilation fan has been broken and is moving more slowly than usual, but it's too late as Lalo pops out of the shadows and guns down all of his men before they can even react. This is when Mike tries calling Gus to tell him that Lalo isn't at the apartment, but Gus is unable to answer due to Lalo now holding him at gunpoint. Lalo takes out his camera and continues his vlogging from the last episode meant for Donald Audio, now showing that he has Gus as a captive inside the laundromat. As Lalo speaks to Eladio, he explains how he wishes that they could both torture Gus slowly together while lounging at Eladio's pool instead of having to kill Gus as quickly as he plans to here. This is quite an interesting piece of dialogue that I feel gets overlooked, as it's yet another example, similar to the origin story of Hector's Bell, that shows how Lalo does sometimes get enjoyment from murder, torture, or overall violence if it's in the form of payback or revenge. Anyways, at this point, they get to the machine hiding the secret entrance to the Super Lab location, but when Gus hesitates to open up the passage, Lalo shoots him in the chest as punishment since Gus is wearing bulletproof armor, so Lalo knows that it won't instantly kill him. I feel like this was a way to sort of to artificially add some tension, action, and violence into the mix, considering that Lalo has Gus at gunpoint when we all know that Gus can't die since he obviously has to survive up to the events of Breaking Bad. Since Lalo is holding Gus at gunpoint and has effectively won in this moment, it makes sense that he'd shoot Gus, but they had to make it somehow purposely not
not fatal. Although the scene did get a reaction out of me when I first saw it, it does hit the idea on the head a bit too much in regard to Gus's character having literal plot armor at this moment. Side note, Giancarlo Esposito does a great job pretending to be shot with his bulletproof vest on, which reminds me a lot of the great job Tony Dalton did when Lalo got hit with the blunt side of Casper's act. They just portray seeming winded as they gas for air very well in such a way that it does realistically look and sound like they're in a lot of pain. Now as Gus collects himself, he reluctantly opens the secret entrance, with Lalo being taken back Back due to being so impressed by it compared to the bathtub tunnel that he had at his compound. As they enter the super lab location, Lalo boasts about the accomplishment of creating it to Eladio in such a cheerful way, almost as if he's mocking the fact that he's about to take it all away from Gus, feeling like he's shoving all the lost potential in Gus's face. Once at the bottom of the stairs, Lalo kicks Gus down the final few steps, causing Gus to land flat on his face in the dirt. I feel like this is a direct contrast to earlier when Lalo first had Gus at gunpoint to his knees, and as Gus stood up, he corrected his clothing in that OC CD way that he does. Here, however, Gus is down in the dirt, unable to correct his demeanor, especially due to still being injured from the gunshot. It's pretty good symbolism for the messy situation that Gus has put himself in. Also, apparently, the actors got a kick out of having to redo this scene many times, as Giancarlo jokes about enjoying how many times he had to get kicked down the stairs by Tony Dalton as he did perform this stunt himself. While Gus struggles to get back up, we get this badass shot of Lalo holding his camera with his mouth as he reloads, which everyone seems to love, myself included. I don't even really know why this looks so badass, but it just does. Lalo tells Gus that his huge hole in the ground will become his tomb, which is pretty ironic considering that it'll actually become Lalo's tomb by the end of the episode, but we'll get to that soon enough. Gus delays Lalo killing him by stating how he wants to trash talk Eladio in Lalo's recording, which gets Lalo excited as Gus is seemingly willing to give Lalo all the proof he could ever need about Gus hating Eladio and wanting revenge against him and the cartel in general. Gus goes on this big monologue about how he truly feels about Eladio in the Salamancas, which is very reminiscent of what Nacho did to Hector and the twins before his death. However, the parallels differ due to Nacho just getting his true feelings off of his chest for the satisfaction of it, whereas Gus is actually also doing it to delay Lalo for long enough so he can set himself up to be in the right spot to trip the lights and grab the gun that he had stashed away episodes ago. Although I do enjoy the idea of Gus taking a page out of Nacho's book, since Gus is just doing it as a distraction, it feels like he's using the idea of Nacho's speech in a shallow and selfish way, even though this is genuine genuinely how he feels. Anyways, Lalo laughs at Gus admitting how he plans to leave Hector as the final Salamanca alive after he's killed the rest of them. This may have been Gus showing his hand a bit too soon, but Lalo doesn't recognize it, just calling it big talk considering that it's unattainable due to the fact that he believes that he's about to kill Gus. Although to Lalo it seems that Gus is admitting what he wishes he could have done, still willing to die with that mindset, in reality the change in Gus's confidence levels here may be Gus actually hyping himself up to do what he's about to do. Right in this moment, Gus trips the lights by unplugging an extension cord with his feet and uses the cover of darkness to run over and grab his stashed gun. Lalo starts shooting at Gus when he does this, and Gus returns fire, creating a quick but intense firefight in the middle of complete darkness. I love how Gus keeps pulling the trigger even though he's out of bullets as we get a close-up of his face showing the complete fear that he's in, unaware if he's successfully killed Lalo or not. Although I do tend to give the show a hard time for Lalo's death being too predictable, I do really like how they focus so much on Gus's character and show how he feels while going through every stage of this situation. Speaking of Lalo's death being too predictable though, at first I had this whole spiel I was going to digress into, but to be honest I feel strongly enough about the topic that I'm thinking of creating an entirely separate video for it, so look out for that in the near future. That being said, I still will give you a Cliff Notes version here which essentially boils down to Lalo's death being slightly underwhelming due to it being so predictable weeks and weeks in advance. I still love this episode, and I even enjoy the entire situation surrounding Lalo's death, but the death itself is something that that I usually gloss over and don't like to think about too much while reminiscing about this episode or this story arc in general due to the predictability kind of causing it to fall flat in my opinion and that kind of sucks. Although I'm not a huge fan of the way that Lalo dies, I do still like the way that Lalo gives his final breaths, laughing in denial that Gus actually got the best of him. If you haven't heard the ugly laugh backstory behind this moment, I highly suggest either listening to the Insider Podcast or watching various interviews where both the writers and Tony Dalton go in depth about Lalo's final moments. After Gus watches Lalo die, the adrenaline in his body starts to die down as he collapses to the ground himself, realizing that he's also been shot, but non-fatally. We then cut to the start of the following morning as Lyle arrives at Los Poyos to open the 
the restaurant for the day, and he's shown to be singing the Los Pollos theme song to himself, which is kinda wild, but just goes to show how much of a golden employee he must be. I mean, it's not totally unbelievable to imagine employees singing their job's theme song as they walk into work, but usually you'd think that they'd be singing it sarcastically or something, whereas Lyle does seem genuine. Anyways, this Lyle scene does a great job of sorta of resetting the episode to deal with the aftermath of what happened now that all the action is concluded, and let me tell you, there's a lot of aftermath, essentially a full episode worth of it bleeding into the next episode, or most of the next episode in general. So as Lyle enters Los Poyos, he gets a call from Gus wanting him to take over for a few days while Gus recovers from his bullet wound, as he's shown to be currently getting patched up while he makes this call. He of course gives Lyle the excuse that he'll be out of town for a family emergency, which is kind of a half-truth, but more on that in the next episode. Also, it's kind of funny how the first thing that Gus thinks to do after getting shot is to call into work, but I guess it does fit his character. Oh, also, this is Lyle's final scene, concluding his multiple appearances this season as yet another returning side character being given a victory lap of sorts. Mike scolds Gus for dangerously rushing to the laundromat with barely any security instead of waiting for Mike, Tyrus, and the rest of their men for backup, but Gus brushes off the semantics since in his eyes, as long as Lalo is dead, he doesn't care. He clearly just wanted the threat of Lalo to be extinguished, and now it finally is, even if it almost cost Gus his own life. Back at the apartment, Mike arrives with Kim and Jimmy reunites with her. Mike also arrives with a new fridge as well, since he plans to use their old fridge to smuggle Howard's body out. Mike first pats down Howard to grab his car keys and tells one of his men to bring it to their warehouse. Mike then goes to confront Jimmy, who is adamant about Lalo returning, but Mike vaguely tells Jimmy that he won't, implying that this time Lalo is dead for good. They only wrote Mike's dialogue about Lalo's fate to be purposely vague to Jimmy, as it unintentionally fuels his PTSD about Lalo to the point where, whenever it gets triggered, he'll be paranoid of Lalo coming after him, also setting up the it wasn't me it was Ignacio moment during Breaking Bad. Mike coaches them on what to do moving forward, he directs them how to act normal the following day, along with what to say when speaking to the police about Howard's disappearance due to them being the last ones who officially saw him alive. During the end of this episode, along with the beginning of the next one, you can kind of tell that Mike isn't happy over the fact that Howard, an innocent man not in the game, was killed and that he kind of subliminally blames Jimmy and Kim for it due to their schemes against him. Mike did previously admit to Kim in 604 that he didn't care about them messing with Howard, but everything changed once Howard was murdered because of it. Granted, Howard's death changed everything about Jimmy and Kim too, but more on that in the next episode. Mike tells Jimmy and Kim that he he's gonna use the slanderous story that they've been creating to ruin Howard's reputation as the reason for Howard's death in order to cover it up. On the surface, it just seems like Mike is using the story to his advantage since it's already set up in place, but in my opinion, the subtext kinda feels like Mike is rubbing salt in the wounds in regard to Jimmy and Kim getting Howard killed as he directs them to keep telling the lie that they've been telling. Mike concludes by persistently telling them that they must act like they're just having a normal day and pretend that none of this ever happened, along with the fact that he and his men will clean up their apartment while they're at work and that by the time they get home at the end of the day, he'll be gone and everything in their apartment will be back to normal. We then cut to Mike burying Lalo and Howard's bodies in a hole that will eventually be under the floor of the super lab, and it's absolutely wild that they actually did this. Even before season 6 started airing, it was a popular fan theory to predict that Lalo would be buried in the south wall, referencing the end of season 4 slash beginning of season 5, and that theory kept getting more and more popular as seasons 5 and 6 aired respectively. Not only are Lalo and Howard secretly buried under the floor of the super lab, meaning that their bodies are hidden under the super lab during the entirety of Breaking Bad, but also just the fact that Howard and Lalo are buried together is so wild to me. It's pretty inconsiderate towards Howard to bury him alongside his murder, but it's also just crazy to think about how Howard was killed by Lalo in 607, then Lalo died one episode later in 608, resulting in both of them being buried together as a way for Mike and his men to brush the entire situation under the rug, so to speak. Before Mike has Howard placed in the hole, he takes Howard's shoes, his wallet, and his wedding ring off of him, which as we know circles back to the cold open for the episode, seeing Howard's car by the beach as part of Mike's cover-up story for his death. Mike told Jimmy and Kim that Howard's car would be found a few states away by the water with drugs in his car, and that's exactly what we saw at the beginning of the episode. While Mike looks at Howard's body, he does give the impression of disapproval, and when Howard's body gets lowered into the grave, Mike tells his men to be gentle with him when they had previously just thrown Lalo's body into the grave without any care, showing that Mike does care about Howard, where he obviously doesn't care 
care about Lalo. So this episode gets an S tier. This is one of the most important episodes of the show and for good reason. Episodes 607 and 608 really feel like two sides of the same coin, giving conclusions to both of the main story arcs for the final season, the Lalo arc and the Howard slash Sandpiper arc. This show went about its conclusion in an interesting way by having its ending spread out through the entire second half of the final season instead of just the final episode or two. Episodes 607 to 609 conclude the 2004 Better Call Saul era, while episodes 610 to 613 conclude the Gene era. So in a way, we've already seen the main ending of the show just halfway through the season. 607 acted as the penultimate, 608 acted as the actual ending of the story, and 609 acted as sort of an epilogue showing the aftermath of the conclusion to the main events. So although I'm a huge fan of episode 608, I'm only giving it S tier instead of double S tier due to a few minor gripes that I had with it, mainly the Lalo death being underwhelming due to being too predictable, along with the mic dialogue towards Jimmy about Lalo. When this episode first came out, I couldn't tell if I liked 607 or 608 more, but in retrospect, I'd have to say I definitely liked 607 just a bit more than 608. Season 6 Episode 9 fun and games. As I mentioned before, this episode acts as an epilogue to the main events that occur in 2004. It mostly concludes Gus and Mike's characters and shows the falling out between Jimmy and Kim. We must first discuss the cold open montage featuring Jimmy and Kim trying to put on a front that they're just having a normal day after the tragic events surrounding Howard and Lalo. We get various shots of Jimmy and Kim going about their business as we cut back and forth between them and Mike cleaning up their apartment. As Mike and his crew clean up Howard's crime scene, they clean up anywhere that Howard's blood could have splattered on, including the painting on the wall, which reveals to Mike the secret con board that Jimmy and Kim had created to plan their schemes against Howard. They also grab the bullet used to kill Howard, which had been lodged into the wall, and then they patch it up. After all is said and done, Mike takes all the remaining evidence and burns it on a beach, which has such an ominous vibe to it, once again implying that Mike isn't okay with the fact that Howard was killed due to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now I'm sure we've all had days where we're experiencing personal issues but I have to put up a front and pretend to be happy in public, but what Jimmy and Kim are going through is a vast extreme of that relatable idea and it really shows. They successfully play their part, but once they get back to their apartment to see it's all been cleaned up as if nothing ever happened the night before, they can't shake the feeling of not wanting to be there. Without even saying any words, they both know that they feel the same, so Jimmy packs for them to stay at a motel, and I definitely don't blame them for having their apartment feel tainted after what they experienced there the night before. The reason why the creators commissioned a custom version of this song is that the original wasn't actually long enough for the entire montage, so they needed to request a longer version of it. Even though the song is originally 3 minutes and 48 seconds, the montage is a whopping 5 minutes long exactly before the song fades out. This montage is so amazing due to the uncanny valley feeling that it gives off, and this is for multiple reasons. First off, the parallel of Jimmy and Kim pretending to have a normal day while cutting away to Mike cleaning up what they're bottling up and hiding from the public is already uncanny enough as it is, but the juxtaposition of the song's ironic lyrics considering the whole situation just gives the entire montage a subtle yet sinister feeling to it. The slow yet beautiful transitions between Jimmy and Kim's normal day to Mike cleaning up the crime scene is also masterfully done, followed by the song ending as Jimmy and Kim get home from their day at work. To state the obvious, the lyrics really hit the situation on the nose in regard to Jimmy and Kim trying to have as normal of a day as possible in order to not implicate themselves by raising any red flags. The song talks about the perfect way to end the perfect day, when in reality Jimmy and Kim are only pretending to have the perfect day in order to solidify the cover-up story that Mike has put into place. Along the fact that them getting home to their apartment is the exact opposite of the perfect way to end a quote perfect day, as you can see the emotionalist disgust on their faces as they unanimously don't want to live in or sleep in the same apartment that Howard was just murdered in as if nothing had ever happened. They're able to put up a front during the day but once they get home that all drains out of them as they're confronted with the reality of what happened the night before, unable to pretend that it never happened as they did when they were at work. The fact that you can really tell how much this is messing with Jimmy and Kim by the end of the montage really gives a realistic portrayal of what going through what they did would do to someone. One of the many brilliant things about the Breaking Bad universe is that since both shows are such a slow burn grounded in reality, when some intense crazy action with life or death stakes happens, we really get to see how it affects the characters involved, especially when it comes to Better Call Saul which is even more of an in-depth character study than Breaking Bad was. This also really makes someone like Lalo who can witness and commit murder without giving it a second thought become emphasized 
just that much more when you see how much normal people such as Jimmy and Kim realistically react to it all in contrast. Now once Jimmy and Kim arrive at the motel where they're staying at for the night, you can already tell how the recent events that they've experienced have ruined their relationship beyond repair simply through their body language in this scene. Nothing is directly said out loud, but you can just tell that something's incredibly off and distant between them just by the way that Kim's laying on the bed facing away as Jimmy sits on the end of the bed with his back facing towards her. Even when Jimmy talks, he can't bear to turn around and look at her when he's speaking, and that in itself already says a lot. Speaking of which, what Jimmy says to Kim is actually yet another paraphrase of what Mike once told him in episode 509. We once saw Jimmy paraphrase advice that Mike gave him in 509 to Kim in regard to having to deal with consequences based on the life decisions that you choose to make, and here we hear the other half of Mike's advice, which is about learning that eventually you can move on with your life from past trauma. This advice, Jimmy tells Kim, has quite the origin story, as it's not not only paraphrased from what Mike once told Jimmy, but is also Mike himself paraphrasing what he once heard Stacy say about his son Maddie at a support group meeting, linking together seasons 4 through 6 in such a brilliant way. Although this advice may have worked for Stacy, Mike, and Jimmy, you can tell that his advice falls on deaf ears when it comes to Kim, as it's not something that she'll ever be able to forget. Also, although Jimmy is telling this to Kim, the way that the scene ends makes me wonder who he's really trying to convince, Kim or himself. It almost sounds like he's trying to reassure himself in this moment as much as he's trying to comfort Kim, but that's just my interpretation. Now, after the title sequence, we see Gus arrive at Don Eladio's place for a cartel meeting. This is why I mentioned that Gus telling Lalo that he'd be out of town for a family emergency was a half-truth, as Gus technically did go out of town to do that, although it's actually a cartel family emergency opposed to a regular one. As Gus pulls up and parks his car, you instantly notice how he's pretty much the only one not driving a flashy car, which is just yet another way of showing Gus's restraint and lack of necessity for material realistic things that other criminals thrive for. As Gus gets patted down for any weapons before entering, he flinches slightly due to the gunshot injuries that he sustained during a shootout with Wallow, which he has to pretend that he doesn't have, as they are the biggest evidence of what truly happened. So Gus meets Eladio poolside with both of the twins and Hector himself, as Hector has brought forward accusations of Gus being behind Lalo's assassination attempt, along with the fact that Lalo actually initially survived it. Hector of course knows that Lalo survived due to Lalo calling him multiple times afterwards, with the second and most recent time being Lalo telling Hector that he was going to confront Gus once and for all, and essentially going guns a-blazing. Now, of course we all know this is just a bluff that Lalo said in order to turn outing himself still being alive to Gus and Mike into a good situation, blah blah blah, but since Lalo did eventually die anyways, it leads Hector to believe that Lalo did somehow confront Gus and died while doing so since Hector hasn't heard from him since. Hector has had his accusations against Gus transcribed by the twins into a letter, which Don Eladio reads out. Hector's letter is incredibly moving and accurate and seems pretty damning. I also love how the letter concludes with Hector stating how he wants blood for blood, which is a code that the Salamancas live by, which Gus just previously called out while confronting Lalo in the previous episode. There's enough stacked against Hector that Eladio and the cartel essentially let Gus get away with it. Eladio brings up every instance of evidence, and in each case, it negates Hector's accusations. From no one ever witnessing Hector's phone calls with Lalo, the twins seeing Lalo's supposed dead body, the dead body matching Lalo's dental records, Nacho vouching that a rival gang hired him to help take out Lalo, along with Bolsa even finding bank statements supporting the idea of this rival gang paying off Nacho due to the envelope that Mike planted in the replacement safe at Nacho's house in 602. Since Gus has methodically stacked the evidence in his favor and against Hector, Hector, along with Lalo's body double actually working against Hector and the Salamancas in this situation, Hector has no proof to back up his claims, leaving it to simple hearsay. It's interesting how Lalo's plans to use a body double to fake his death was originally for his advantage, but it ended up working against him in the end after his real death. Also, not only is the evidence stacked in Gus's favor, but the fact that Gus is such a good earner for the cartel, along with the fact that they need his distribution methods, allows them to oversee the obvious right in front of them as they still want Gus to work for them. Since Hector's way of communicating by spelling out each word individually is so long and drawn out, I can only imagine how taxing it must have felt to translate this entire accusation letter about Gus, and then for it to just be shot down due to lack of evidence, even though everyone knows that it's true, just must be incredibly frustrating for Hector. Duermes en mi cama. No, insisto. 
After Eladio tells Hector that he's essentially not going to act on Hector's claims, we get a few uplifting moments as Eladio brushes off the accusations. When Eladio tells Hector that he can stay the night and even take his own bed, Eladio purposely misinterprets Hector's angry bell ringing as him arguing against Eladio's generosity when obviously Hector is angered at the idea of Eladio letting Gus get away with Lalo's murder. We then comedically see the twins carry Hector up a few steps while leading him away, which is the second time we've seen this happen this season, with the first being at the end of 603 after Nacho's death. The creators had to have done this on purpose because it's the second time they've undercut a serious moment with the comedic sight of the twins menacingly carrying Hector in his wheelchair. Now after Hector leaves, we get one final comedic moment as Eladio brushes off Hector's anger towards the outcome of the situation by distastefully mocking Hector's condition. <laughs> Although it's pretty ridiculous and iconic to see Eladio do this, it does fall flat as Bolsa and Gus can tell that it's in poor taste. Along with the fact that Eladio is really the only one who's allowed to disrespect and make fun of anyone without getting in any kind of trouble for it. After Hector leaves, the way that Eladio confronts Gus implies that Eladio wasn't fooled by Gus's cover-up and that he can see through the situation for what it truly is. He's letting Gus off the hook as long as he keeps earning for the cartel and doesn't cross the line when it comes to the hatred Eladio can clearly tell that Gus has towards him. I love how in Hector's letter, he tells Eladio to look in Gus's eyes and that he'll see the hatred that Gus has towards him. So when Eladio confronts Gus after Hector leaves, he admits to Gus that he does see hatred in his eyes, but that as long as he doesn't see too much, he'll let it slide. It really makes Eladio seem more self-aware than we originally thought. Although Eladio is usually dismissed as stupid, this implication implies that Eladio isn't really as stupid as he initially puts on. Granted, it is foolish to allow Gus to continue working for him considering their eventual fate during Breaking Bad, but I still like how this scene gives layers to Eladio's character that we didn't previously know that he had. As Eladio leaves, Bolsa goes to pour himself a drink in relief of the situation turning out in his favor, but doesn't even consider pouring Gus a drink too. This just goes to show how Bolsa thinks of himself more highly than he does Gus, still considering Gus as his underling since he is Gus's middleman to the cartel. Even though Bolsa is relieved that Eladio sided with Gus, it's not because he cares about Gus's well-being, but it's because Gus being a good earner reflects positively upon himself, feeling the reason why Bolsa constantly takes Gus's side and wants Gus to work things out with the Salamancas and the cartel. The scene ends with a shot of Gus looking down toward Eladio's pool, which parallels the shot of Gus doing the same thing in Breaking Bad episode 410 when Gus exacts his revenge on Eladio and the cartel. This shot implies that this is the exact moment that Gus started creating his plan to take out the cartel that we eventually see in Breaking Bad 410. Since now that the threat of Lalo has been taken care of, Gus can continue his long-term plan of taking out Eladio and the cartel, not only getting revenge against them for killing his former partner Max, but also in order to cut them out and become his own boss, which Lalo even called him out for in the previous episode. This just proves that although Eladio isn't as stupid as we all thought, he still is foolish for siding with Gus and keeping him alive and employed just due to Gus being a big earner for him. As I mentioned, as Eladio walked away, he told Gus that a little bit of hate in his eyes was okay as long as Gus didn't forget that he was his boss, but then Gus immediately walks towards the pool and defies this by plotting to take out Eladio. This is also the final scene in the show for everyone at this meeting aside from Gus, along with this being Gus's final episode in the show as well, but there's still a few more scenes to go, which we'll get into right now. So as Gus returns home, he opens up all of his windows to imply that he can finally let his guard down and breathe now that Lalo is dead, and the cartel won't be coming after him for it. Gus goes to his basement to meet Mike at the secret tunnel to his safe house, and Mike gives him a bottle of pills left for him by the doctor for the quote, off chance that Gus returned alive. Once again implying how serious the meeting with Eladio was, because if Eladio sided with Hector, Gus would have surely been killed. Mike informs Gus that Jimmy and Kim played their part of the cover-up story perfectly, even when it came to speaking to the police, and that their cover-up story for Howard has worked. Gus instantly orders Mike to find a new crew to finish the Superlab construction project, and they go their separate ways, with Mike returning to the safe house as Gus returns upstairs, marking the final scene of Mike and Gus together in the show. And then right afterwards is Gus's final scene of the show, which includes him relaxing for a short moment at a bar slash lounge that he must have used to regular at. Now although this scene is like 6 minutes long, which is a long time to show Gus calmly sitting at a bar during one of the final episodes of Better Call Saul, it's a short time considering this is truly the only time that we've ever seen Gus try to unwind and enjoy the elegancy of a normal life's pastime. Since this is the fifth final episode of the show, many viewers wondered what the heck we were doing watching Gus at this bar for so long, feeling like 
it was wasting screen time for one of the final episodes, along with the fact that many viewers didn't really understand the point of this entire scene in the first place. Although I kind of just stayed neutral towards this scene when I first saw it, every time I've watched it since, I've grown more and more appreciation for it. Although this is technically the fifth final episode, when you look at 609 through the lens that I've been talking about, about it being an epilogue to the penultimate and final episodes of 607 and 608, you truly start accepting and understanding why 609 slows us down in this way. At the time of this scene airing, we didn't know it yet, but since 609 is the final episode in the 2004 era, this was actually Gus's final scene in the entire show, along with a send-off for his character in general, setting himself up to go on the trajectory that he does during Breaking Bad. This scene essentially boils down to Gus finally feeling like he can enjoy himself for a moment now that the threat of Lalo and the cartel is gone, but it's tragic in a way as he doesn't allow himself to enjoy this moment for long. If Gus were to lead a normal life, this is an activity that he would do regularly, but his current lifestyle sadly doesn't accommodate for it, and he realizes that. He even subtly flirts with a man at the bar that he clearly knows and is catching up with, but he leaves the bar before the man returns with a bottle of fancy wine to show him, as Gus can't allow himself to get close to another person again. This could be sort of a defense mechanism due to what happened to his former partner Max, making Gus feel like he can't have strong emotional connections towards somebody because it could possibly be used against him as a weakness, along with worrying that anyone he becomes emotionally attached to could potentially get killed in a similar manner to Max, along with the fact that Gus's current lifestyle simply doesn't have time for normal human connections anymore. Personally, I think it's a bit of all the above, but regardless, this scene does do an excellent job at showing us a side of Gus that we've never truly seen before, along with implying why Gus has to restrain himself from acting upon what he wants. As I mentioned, the scene ends before Gus's friend returns to him, which is also due to the fact that as Gus sits there at the bar by himself, he thinks about all the things that still need to be done in regard to his ultimate plan, taking down the cartel and creating his empire, so he leaves with much work still to do. We then get Mike's final few scenes of the show, at least in the 2004 era, as there are still two missing scenes involving him that we'll be discussing in future episodes. Anyways, as Mike returns home, Nacho's father crosses his mind while putting away his gun due to still having the fake ID for Nacho's father that he took from Nacho's safe back in 602. I discussed this more in depth during my video covering the full story of Mike, but essentially, getting closure for a missing or dead loved one holds a strong importance to Mike due to Maddie. We've seen multiple examples of this throughout both shows, such as during Better Call Saul Season 3 when Mike went to dig up the Good Samaritan's body after he felt bad due to hearing that Anita never got closure for her missing husband. So Mike goes to Nacho's father's upholstery shop late that night with the intention of giving Nacho's father closure about what happened to Nacho, but it doesn't go the way that Mike expected. Whether Mike wanted to feel satisfaction in telling Nacho's father the truth, or at least wanted to see Nacho's father gain satisfaction himself for getting closure over what happened to Nacho, neither ends up happening. Mike talks highly in Nacho to Nacho's father, telling him that Nacho wasn't like the rest of the criminals that he surrounded himself with, and that Mike will personally get revenge on the people who killed him. Since Mike admits to being there when Nacho was killed, Nacho's father looks at Mike with disgust, saying how Mike is no better than the people who actually killed Nacho as Mike sat around and allowed it to happen. Happen. Nacho's father also calls out Mike wanting revenge not being justice, and that getting revenge on Nacho's killers will never truly bring them to justice. This is incredibly important as Nacho's father is essentially calling out Mike's morals and ideals when it comes to revenge, which was the main driving force that convinced Mike to bond with Gus and work for him long term. Side note, I also love the cinematography during the scene between Mike and Nacho's father, especially that one angle of Mike behind the chain link fence while Nacho's father is free. The shot hits the symbolism right on the nose, but I love it for that. It's interesting how the show takes seasons to build up this idea of Gus and Mike having the same ideals when it comes to revenge and they bond over it, just to have Nacho's father understandably and righteously call out Mike for his ideals being skewed and that he is actually no different than the people that he's working against, which is what Mike once accused Gus of in season 5. Although I'm sad that episodes 603 and 604 never focused on the aftermath of Nacho's death at all, I do still like this final scene with Mike and Nacho's father, at least for closing up that loose end. We always wondered if Mike would have to somehow protect Nacho's father from Gus or the cartel, but here we see how that's not a concern, and Nacho's father is able to live out the rest of his days working at his shop like he always wanted, even though he now tragically doesn't have a son to pass the shop down to anymore. So that concludes all of the cartel related scenes in the episode, and now onto the Jimmy and Kim side. Quick side note though, when this episode first aired, it started out very much like a slow Gus episode, so about halfway through the episode, a lot of people were wondering where it was headed. That being said, this episode quickly transitioned 
transitions from a Mike and Gus episode to an extremely important Kim and Jimmy episode. It's actually wild how much still has to happen during the rest of the episode, so let's jump into it. We first start out with Jimmy and Kim arriving at HHM for Howard's memorial, and while waiting at the elevator in the underground parking lot, Jimmy notices how HHM finally replaced the trash can that he'd kick in frustration during earlier seasons, mainly the pilot episode. The dented trash can always stayed the same throughout the entire run of the show, kind of as a reminder of where it all started, and was meant to be a reference to Walt punching the towel dispenser in Breaking Bad 209, and then seeing it again much later in the series during episode 508. Anyways, while waiting for the elevator, Jimmy encourages Kim to even make an appearance, stating how they'll only be there for 20 minutes tops. Again, it sounds like Jimmy's trying to motivate himself just as much as he's trying to motivate her. As they enter the main lobby, we get a wide pan out shot of the entire memorial with photos of Howard on canvases all over, which are mostly taken from Patrick Fabian's Instagram. They first go speak to Rich, who informs them of a few huge details to wrap up and conclude the story of HHM. Rich tells them that this is probably the last time that any of them will be in the building, due to the fact that HHM is downsizing and relocating, and also changing its name to Bruckner Partners. Although it is tragic, I do really like how they gave a proper conclusion to HHM, considering it was so important to the show throughout most of its run, especially during the first three to four seasons. I definitely agree when Rich calls it the end of an era, along with the line from Rich being taken out of context and repurposed towards the entire show ending as a whole. Rich points out Cheryl and Cliff above, so Jimmy and Kim go to give their condolences. When they reach the top of the stairs, they put their glasses down on the railing, and the show lingers on it for just long enough that it feels like it has some sort of deeper meaning to it, but to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what that is. I guess let me know your interpretation of it in the comments. So as Jimmy and Kim pay their respects to Cheryl, she takes their rhetorical gesture of offering her help if she ever needs it, and actually responds to it by asking about how they were the last ones to see Howard alive. She accuses Jimmy of scheming against Howard, and Jimmy tries to cover himself by instead admitting that he should have been nicer to Howard than he was due to his resentment against Howard for always having Chuck's respect when Jimmy never did. It's weird that Jimmy even says this, because since he's admitting to having a resentment against Howard, he's essentially implicating himself for having motivation to mess with Howard like Cheryl thinks. Now I get that Jimmy's just trying to make an excuse as to why Howard would have told Cheryl that Jimmy was messing with him, but it still implicates himself. Although Jimmy's just trying to talk himself out of this situation, I do believe that he feels horrible about going after Howard for the Sandpiper money. Ever since the season 5 finale, Jimmy knew that Howard didn't deserve whatever hell they planned on putting him through during season 6, but he could have never imagined that Howard would have died due to it, which is obviously a much worse consequence than Jimmy could have ever imagined even when he thought about worst case scenario. Cheryl continues to interrogate Jimmy about Howard, calling him out for denying that he was messing with Howard along with confronting him on the idea that Howard secretly had a drug problem. She doesn't believe that, thinking there has to be more to the story. Now, since it's so hard for Jimmy and Kim to be at Howard's memorial while knowing the secret truth of what happened to him, even ever since they were waiting for the elevator, Jimmy seemed like the one to take charge and force himself to make conversation while acting innocent when meanwhile, Kim mostly just kept to herself and stayed silent. This is until Cheryl keeps accosting Jimmy about Howard, which causes Kim to step in and save the day in the most brutal way possible. Cheryl's understandably suspicious of the entire situation and doesn't believe any of it, backing Jimmy into a corner, causing Kim to feel like she needs to step in to save the day by covering up any implications towards them and getting Cheryl off of their back. This includes manipulating Cheryl into believing that Howard was on drugs and that she was just too distant from him to see that. Kim makes up a fake story of witnessing Howard snorting drugs late one night at HHM back when Kim still worked there, implying that Howard has had a drug problem for the better part of a year, which would have been around the time that Howard and Cheryl started having marital problems, resulting in Howard sleeping in the guest house. With everything Howard's had to deal with the past year or so, including the debt, guilt, and depression from Chuck dying, HHM downsizing its reputation being ruined due to the backlash of it, along with his marriage failing, it's hypothetically possible that Howard could have turned to drugs as a coping mechanism of sorts. When Cheryl asks Cliff if he's ever seen anything implicating Howard of having any drug use, when Cliff gives a non-answer back, Cheryl realizes that it could all be true. Right as Cheryl is starting to fall for the lies, Kim sticks the nail in the coffin by using the ruse of confiding her to actually guilt her by mentioning how since she was his wife, if anyone would have noticed anything, it would have been her. When in reality, Kim knows that their marriage was distant and failing, so she uses that against Cheryl in order to manipulate her into feeling bad about ignoring Howard and not noticing any warning 
warning signs, all of potentially making her feel guilty for being the reason that Howard could have turned to drugs in the first place. This causes Cheryl to rush away to the bathroom to cry over the realization that maybe she was oblivious about what was happening with Howard after all. I'd like to point out that while Kim is manipulating Cheryl, the way that Jimmy just stands behind her with almost a look of disapproval reminds me a lot of the way that Jimmy did pretty much the exact same thing when Kim was blackmailing the Kettleman's at the end of 602. Throughout season 6, we've seen Kim do things and act in ways that she never originally would have during the earlier seasons, and it's to the point that sometimes even Jimmy is taken back by it, feeling possibly guilty for being such a bad influence on Kim that he's turned her into this. What's ironic is that Cheryl won't believe a word Jimmy says because she thinks that it was him who was constantly messing with Howard, when in reality, Kim was the mastermind behind it all. Sure, Jimmy originally started doing it back in Season 5, but Kim really took it to the next level in Season 6, and was really the driving force throughout the entire season. Cheryl doesn't know that though, so when Kim steps in to manipulate her, Cheryl completely believes her. Although I never really liked Cheryl when we were introduced to her earlier in the season just because of how poorly she seemed to be treating Howard, I do feel incredibly bad for her. It was already difficult for Kim to be there in general, let alone make small talk, so to manipulate and gaslight Cheryl in the way that she did, even though it was just to cover their asses and get Jimmy out of the situation, it was absolutely brutal and heartbreaking in such a dark way for both the audience and Kim herself, as this was most likely the final straw to cause Kim to quit the law throughout the rest of the episode, which we'll be discussing next. Once Jimmy and Kim leave HHM for the final time, as they walk into the underground parking garage from the elevator, we get shown it in the exact same shot as the pilot episode when we saw our first real scene between Jimmy and Kim sharing a cigarette together after Jimmy beat up the trash can in frustration. So as they walk back to their cars, Jimmy tries comforting Kim by saying that although that was really tough, it's over now, unaware of how literal and right his words truly are. As I just said moments ago, manipulating and gaslighting Cheryl to believe that Howard was on drugs was the final straw for Kim, so I believe that this is the exact moment that she decides to both quit the law and break up with Jimmy, marking the end of her life in Albuquerque. The way that Kim reacts to this before driving away truly shows that the writing is on the wall, that her relationship with Jimmy is already over. All she does is give him one final kiss and then leaves without saying a single word, leaving Jimmy standing there alone. We then see Kim fidgeting with her pen while in court due to being anxious over the fact that she's quitting her career. She tried filing a motion requesting a withdrawal from the case, but since since it was so last minute, it didn't get through in time, causing her to still need to show up in court. This results in Kim publicly stating that she's no longer an attorney due to the judge persisting on wanting a more specific reason for her withdrawal. Although this is probably not how Kim quitting would have realistically happened, I do still like how it's dramatized in this way to make Kim quitting much more of a shock. This mic drop moment was totally unexpected but makes complete sense when considering Kim's character and how she feels about everything that's happened. Quick side note, it's also interesting how Kim is getting paid for Mesa Verity to take over pro bono cases for for her. Is this just a favor that Kim asked Paige to temporarily do to conclude all of her current cases so that her clients aren't hung up to dry? Or could Paige actually be starting to work on pro bono cases as well in general? Kim originally became a lawyer not only because she wanted to make something of her life and become successful, but also because she wanted to help people who were in need of it. Due to everything that's happened with Howard, Kim feels like she's abused her powers of the law and doesn't deserve them anymore, causing her legal career to become so tainted as she doesn't feel like she deserves to be a lawyer any longer. Longer. It's truly tragic seeing Kim quit her job, but it is due to her own actions. If you remember at the end of episode 606, she could have cancelled the mediation con and just gone to Santa Fe to try to accomplish her dream job of opening a pro bono practice law firm legitimately, but since she turned that down in favor of getting Sandpiper to settle, she has no one else to blame but herself. If Kim would have just gone to the Santa Fe meeting and called off the mediation con, Howard would have still lived to see another day, along with Kim potentially still continuing her life as a lawyer and eventually earning her dream job legitimately. Kim was given an ultimatum and chose to go down bad choice road instead of doing things the proper way and now she'll have nothing to show from it at all. And I have a full video discussing this in depth that I did recently, I'll have it linked in the description in case you want to check it out. But after having a few days to now process everything that's happened, Kim is now removing the blinders that she once had in regard to her own actions. Kim was having too much fun screwing with Howard and Cliff that she had tunnel vision towards forcing Sandpiper to settle, but now that Howard has died due to it, she's finally realizing the unintended consequences of her actions. She feels so guilty over Howard's death and everything else that she did to him to the point that she quits the law, meaning that she'll never accomplish her goal of making her pro bono dream job a reality. Also, she feels so bad about Howard's death that she doesn't even want to accept any of the Sandpiper money either. She wants absolutely nothing to do with the law, nothing to do with conning, and 
nothing to do with anything that came from it. I actually really like this realization that Kim is having over how much of a monster she became, because the way that she's acted throughout the entire season actually did make me start to dislike her character a lot. Just go back to the videos that I did during the season 6 mid-season break just after episode 607 aired, I was really starting to hate Jimmy and Kim for what they did to Howard. Now that Kim is finally opening her eyes and accepting responsibility for her actions, it redeems her character a little bit in my eyes due to her now taking accountability for what she did when she was originally dodging it throughout the first half of the season even when Howard confronted them about it at the end of 607 right up until his death. This really makes me feel like I walked perfectly into the trap that the creator set up and I love it. It's almost like they purposely wanted us all to start hating Jimmy and Kim for their actions, especially Kim considering how she's changed over the past 10 episodes or so. They made us start to hate Kim specifically, but then having Kim realize the unintended consequences of her actions and take accountability for it does somewhat redeem the character and allow us to somewhat forgive her, even though she'll never be able to forgive herself. This is the type of storytelling that I live for, where I become so emotionally attached to a character that the creators make me feel upset towards Kim for the decisions that she makes, but then they reel me back in to feel validated once Kim starts finally acknowledging her own actions and mistakes and actually feels guilt for it. This sends me on a roller coaster of emotions and opinions where I initially love a character, grow to somewhat despise them, but then lighten up on them and have them partially redeemed in my eyes by the end of the ride. This show just does such a great job in humanizing its characters and grounding them in reality that you truly feel invested with them in every way possible, which is just yet another reason why this show is such an amazing character study. We then get one final balcony scene of Kim waiting for Jimmy to arrive home, knowing the bomb that's about to go off due to not only Jimmy hearing that Kim quit the law, but also Kim preparing to break up with Jimmy. It's just one of those things where no matter how much time you have to prepare for it, you're never ready for it and it really shows. You know that Kim's already made up her mind due to having already partly packed up her things, but even so, she's still not ready to confront Jimmy about it but knows that it needs to be done. When Jimmy confronts her, he tries getting her to reel back her decision to quit the law, but it's too late. It's interesting how this happens in 609, as it's a direct parallel to 509 when Jimmy came home and confronted her on leaving Mesa Verde and Schweikart and Coakley. In both situations, Jimmy disagrees with her choice, tries to get her to go back on it, but in both instances, it's too late to do so. As Jimmy tries convincing Kim to not quit being a lawyer by telling her that her clients need her, in reality, he's the one that needs her. I also love the frustrated yet defeated noise that Jimmy makes when Kim tells him that it's already done. They need you. It's already done. Oh! What's really tragic is that Jimmy tries talking her through this as if they're going to work as a team to fix it, when in reality she's about to break up with him. You can tell that Kim also tried telling Jimmy that she wanted to break up with him and move out of the apartment, but Jimmy's so focused on trying to get Kim to undo her decision to quit the law that he keeps cutting her off and doesn't even give her a chance to get a word in edgewise. All right, all right, I know why, but Kim, you can't just- Jimmy, I-, I Just let me say my piece, okay? Just let's take a breath here. Kim. It's not until Jimmy distractingly walks into their bedroom that he notices all of her stuff packed up, giving yet another mic drop revelation, which is that she's leaving him. This also has great timing, showing that although Jimmy wants to work through their problems as a team, right after he says this, he walks into their room and sees all her stuff packed, revealing that not only is she leaving her career as a lawyer behind, but she's leaving him behind. It's interesting how they did both have the same idea of wanting to move out of the apartment, as their home now feels violated to the point that they definitely require a new home to even begin feeling comfortable in their own skin. Watching Kim and Jimmy's breakup scene is truly heartbreaking, especially when Jimmy tries pleading and begging with her to stay, as she makes him happy. I do like how Kim acknowledges that together, they're toxic for everyone around them, and how she realizes that now when she used to ignore it. It's a great callback to the season 5 finale. Now as a last ditch effort to try and convince Kim to stay, Jimmy tells her that he loves her, which is incredibly impactful as it's the first time that we've ever heard him say that to her on screen, and due to this, it feels really weird to hear out loud. Now, this can be interpreted in multiple different ways where some viewers believe that this was the first time that they had ever said it out loud, while others think that they've said it before but off screen. Regardless, this is the first time that we've ever heard them say it on screen, which further shows how desperate Jimmy is to try and keep Kim, along with once again reminding us that Jimmy and Kim have always had a very abnormal relationship. Jimmy has also always been scared of losing Kim as a recurring theme throughout the show ever since they started truly seeing each other. Since Jimmy is stressed out over potentially losing Kim in one way or another at least once every season, it must feel like trying to prevent the inevitable with that now finally coming to fruition. When Jimmy tries blaming Lalo for the tragedy that unfolded, Kim also finally admits to Jimmy that she knew that Lalo was still alive. 
I love how this finally comes back around, as it's been a huge lingering question and plot point ever since Mike told her about Lalo's survival in episode 604. This leads to Kim admitting that she had tunnel vision for what she was doing all season long due to having too much fun conning, but now the unintended consequences of her actions have finally caught up with her and that it's too much to handle resulting in her just wanting to run away from it all. Now I almost said that she just wants to put it in the past and move on with her life, but as we see during the final few episodes of the show, she never was truly able to move on from it, but we'll be discussing that more in depth later on in the video. Ray Seahorn does yet another terrific job here portraying Kim's self-realization as she explains how she was having too much fun to stop their cons in such a way where she seemingly feels disgusted in herself for what they've done. It's as if everything surrounding Howard's death from Lalo to Cheryl has given her a wake-up call with a moment of clarity to grasp the situation for what it truly is. You'd want us to run and hide until you were sure I was safe? He would pull the plug on the scam and then we'd break up. And I didn't want that because I was having too much fun. <laughs> As Kim goes back to packing her things, she once again leaves Jimmy alone standing there with nothing to say. And then the show jarringly jumps to about a year in the future with Jimmy now having completed his transformation as Saul Goodman. Throughout the show, there have been many things that have stopped Jimmy from fully turning into Saul, but now they're all gone. From Chuck never approving of him to both Chuck and Howard dying, all of his courthouse co-workers now exiling him out of hatred, and now Kim leaving him, everyone who once knew him as Jimmy McGill is no longer in his life. Kim was the final thing holding him back, and now that she's gone, well, we see how that's affected him. And it's honestly perfect. We're always waiting for the moment of when's he gonna fully turn into Saul, How, why is that gonna happen, when's he gonna get his Cadillac, when's he gonna get the office, etc, etc, when's he gonna rehire Francesca, and it all accumulated to this moment of Kim leaving him being the final straw to break the camel's back to finally push him into that Saul Goodman life 24-7. We always thought of Saul Goodman as a comedic relief side character during Breaking Bad, but Better Call Saul has given him an incredibly tragic twist where he's putting on the Saul Goodman persona 24-7 seven to keep himself constantly busy in order to distract himself from his own depressing thoughts. As we see during the time skip, Jimmy puts on the Saul persona from the second he wakes up to the second he falls asleep. He grabs his Bluetooth earpiece the second he wakes up and starts making business calls and planning out his day with Francesca, and he brings home sex workers on the regular to keep his mind off of the true loneliness that he feels at home. Turns out that the advice that he told Kim at the beginning of the episode, which in turn Mike once told him in regard to just one day being able to forget about your past trauma, well it hasn't worked out so well for him since if it did, he wouldn't be constantly trying to distract himself from thinking about it. I do like seeing Saul actually living in his mansion though, especially after seeing its somewhat tragic fate during the 601 cold open after Saul abandoned it and went into hiding. Although there are certain scenes of Saul out and about during Breaking Bad, for the most part, most of the Saul scenes take place in his office, with his also never learning about his personal life. And due to this, it makes the 609 time skip just that much more intriguing as we see Saul in his personal life from the moment he gets up before he even heads into work. And it's shockingly depressing to realize that the answer is that he's all Saul all the time. We always wondered what he'd be like when he was outside of work, but the answer is more depressing than we expected. He chooses to still continue to act the exact same. He's become so self-removed from the humane side of himself that he never takes off the Saul Goodman mask even when he's at home. Ever since season one, we were all anxiously waiting waiting for him to finally transform into Saul, but now that he has, it's way more sad and depressing than we ever could have imagined, causing most of us to honestly just want Jimmy back. In my opinion, the show creators did just such a great job creating Jimmy to be such a sympathetic character that we can root for, and then tear him down and deconstruct him while devolving him into the toxic and loathsome Saul Goodman that we've always known. This episode gets a double S tier easy. Now when this episode originally came out, I gave it an A tier as I was happy with it, but didn't absolutely love it the way others did. That being said, I gotta say, this episode has grown on me the more and more I rewatched it, along with its relation to the final season. As I mentioned beforehand, going into this episode, we didn't know that it'd be the final episode in the 2004 timeline, but now that we do in retrospect, it works a lot better in my opinion, which is how the creators must have felt while creating it. And again, as I said, if you look at this episode from the 
perspective of being an epilogue to the 2004 timeline, with episode 607 and 608 being the true penultimate and finale episodes, episode 607 to 609 work beautifully and went strong all together back to back. I also love this episode the further into it that we get. It starts out with concluding Gus and Mike's story in 2004 respectively, kind of starting off slow and yada yada, but then we get into the Jimmy and Kim stuff and so much happens. We see the conclusion to HHM's story, Howard's story through Kim manipulating Cheryl, which caused Kim to quit the law, break up with Jimmy, move away from Albuquerque, answering the huge series long question of is Kim still with Jimmy during Breaking Bad and Oh, if that wasn't enough, we then get the crazy flash forward to sometime in 2005 as Jimmy has now fully become Saul Goodman now that Kim is no longer in his life anymore. Seeing the time skip at the end of the episode was truly a hype moment, and it feels like an isolated timeline in itself as we've never really seen much of 2005 specifically after Jimmy has become Saul now that Kim has left his life and before he ever meets Walt and Jesse to kick off the events of Breaking Bad in 2008 and 2009. Season 6 Episode 10 El Cagino, or I mean Nippy. This episode marks the first of four full black and white Gene episodes, and the titles reflect that. For the first nine episodes of season six, the episode titles have had a blank and blank titling theme, wine and roses, carrot and stick, etc. But now that we're finished with the 2004 era and we're now moving on to the post Breaking Bad 2010 era, that titling theme is now completely gone. Also, this marks the beginning of the intro title sequences being cut off and changing to just a blue screen with quick flashes of moments to come. But if you want a more in depth analysis, of the title sequences and how they change over the seasons. I have a full video discussing that, which I'll have linked in the description at the end of the video. This episode introduces Carol Burnett as Marion, Jeff the cab driver's mother. As we get introduced to her while grocery shopping, she tries out a sample of Schnoz Farm Cheese, which is definitely a reference to Tom Schnoz. Now on her way home, she gets stuck on a curb, but here comes Jean to save the day. In reality, Jean has definitely been doing research on Jeff off camera, resulting in him discovering Marion, who he'll use as his anchor to get to Jeff. I wonder how long Jean has been staking them out to know exactly where Marion goes out, along with the exact path that she takes back to her house, just so he can be there at that exact moment to meet her under the ruse that he's putting up flyers for his fake missing dog Nippy, which the episode is named after. This entire cold open was a premeditated situation that Jean put into place, as Jean definitely packed the snow on the curb so that she would get stuck and require his help. Once he goes to help her, he shuts down her scooter, requiring her to reluctantly ask him to help push her all the way home, where they start getting to know each other in order for Jean to be in good graces with her by the time that Jeff arrives home. I love the way that Jean surprises Jeff by innocently becoming friends with his mother. It feels like a surprise checkmate by Jean. Speaking of Jeff, I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that his character has actually been recast from Don Harvey to Pat Healy, which was somewhat of a jarring experience to get used to, even with the creators releasing teaser trailers of the recasting before the episodes came out to get us used to the new Jeff in advance. Although the old Jeff and the new Jeff seem very different, apparently the recast was done after they had already scripted the final few episodes, so it's not like they changed the character to accommodate for the new actor, as the old actor would have played the exact same role with the same dialogue and everything. As much as I like the old Jeff for being so goofy yet sinister, I really enjoy the new Jeff too, as he's really grown on me throughout the final few episodes of the show. Pat Healy makes Jeff way more sympathetic of a character, and we'll get more into why throughout the rest of the video. So as Jeff comes home to the surprise of Gene in his kitchen, with Marion, Gene does such a hilariously good job playing up his Mr. Takovic persona. I especially love the moment where he says, please, Mr. Takovic was my father, call me Gene. Since both Jeff and Gene know that obviously he has a fake name and that there never was a Mr. Takovic Sr. Gene obviously pretends to have never met Jeff before, which results in him hearing the same Sammy Hagar story from Marion, referencing how Jeff told him about that already during the season 5 Gene scene. Gene and Jeff eventually go outside to speak privately and honestly, as Jeff confronts Gene on what the heck he's even doing. I really like the Gene and Jeff dynamic throughout the rest of the show, with it already off to a good start as Gene jokes about Jeff not having to call him dad, at least not yet. Put a pin in that. Gene confronts Jeff right back and tells him that he knows that Jeff wants to be in the game and that Gene's gonna help him learn how to be a proper con man. After the conclusion of the 2004 era throughout episode 607 to 609, this episode acts as a soft reset considering 
considering it's setting up a new story to conclude the Gene 2010 era throughout the final four episodes of the show. Due to this, this episode focuses on lower stakes as Gene and Jeff get to know each other while working together on low-level cons. Considering what's to follow in future episodes, I don't mind this episode having more of a light-hearted and goofy vibe to it as the small-time cons that Gene and Jeff do together are reminiscent of earlier seasons of the show. This episode does a great job building Jeff and Marion's characters while also giving us more of a look into Gene's life than we've had during the first five entire seasons. So once Gene gets back home, he listens in on his police radio to make sure that Jeff hasn't called him in, meaning that he's willing to play ball. What Gene did to get an angle on Jeff was quite risky, but it's almost like he enjoys the thrill of it. He puts on his iconic Marco pinky ring, implying that he's reverting back to Saul Goodman or even slipping Jimmy. As we saw throughout all the previous Gene scenes, Gene felt like a hollow shell of his former self, as he hated having to isolate himself due to being such a normally social guy. We've seen hints at Gene wanting to revert back to Saul as he clearly misses it. Now, having to handle the Jeff situation on his own is a perfect excuse to do what Gene always wanted to during his time in hiding, to bring out the Saul Goodman and Slippin' Jimmy in himself in such a way that he feels like he's reliving the glory days. He's like an addict who's addicted to conning, and this is giving him a perfect excuse to relapse even if he knows that he shouldn't due to it putting himself at risk. So Gene plans on robbing a clothing store with Jeff as their first con, with the first step being getting on the good side of the mall security in order to distract them for as long as he can in order to give Jeff a time frame to work in while robbing the store. While Frank eats a Cinnabon, Gene secretly times him on his watch and does this over and over again in order to get an average time that it'll take, which will be the window that Jeff has to work in. I really do like both of these mall cops, Frank and Nick, even if watching Frank, played by Jim O'Hare, eating Cinnabons over and over again really starts to get on my nerves due to all the eating ASMR that we got to deal with in this episode. That being said, this has to be some of the best advertising that Cinnabon has ever gotten, as I instantly crave a Cinnabon bun every time I watch this episode not sponsored. I like how Nick is the same mall cop from the season 3 Gene scene when Gene yelled at the thief getting arrested to get a lawyer, which Nick mocks him for in this episode. Say nothing, you understand? Get a lawyer! Get a lawyer. Asshole. Yeah, I remember you. Get a lawyer! Gene starts giving the mall cops free Cinnabons under the ruse that he's thanking them for calling an ambulance for him during the season 4 Gene scene, and then continues to regularly bring them more after each shift in order to grow rapport with them and become their friends. In order to bond with Frank, Gene even starts reading up on local sports in order to be able to create conversation with him. I also really like this montage that we get of Gene as he goes to visit the mall cops day after day. I swear, the creators can make any mundane activity feel exciting by creating a montage out of it. We also get a few more references to previous Gene scenes, such as season 2 with Gene walking past the janitor every time he brings the Cinnabons to the mall cops, even with us seeing a glimpse of the SG was here carving as well. They even got the rights to use the Mission Impossible song, Jim on the Move, which fits perfectly with the montage, along with the fact that the name of the song obviously references Jimmy being on the move, hustling cons again. Now the next step in the clothing store heist is for Gene to count out the steps that it takes to get from one rack of clothing to the next, in order to set up a perimeter in a field for Jeff to practice in. I absolutely love the rhymes that that Gene creates in order for Jeff to remember which order to grab the expensive clothing in. It's so catchy that I still remember most of them without even having to think about it, just further showing how this really could work to some extent. The part that doesn't quite add up though is the fact that Jeff only has 3 minutes to grab all the clothes that he can, when in reality when Jeff's actor Pat Healy actually did the entire run in one go, it actually took him about 10 minutes to do so. Now when Jeff starts getting doubts about the whole scheme, Gene pressures him into it by implying that he's too chicken, along with motivating him by referencing how rich Walt became after working with him. Gene, however, obviously only tells Jeff the upside to the money that Walt made, while leaving out all the negative details that actually happened to Walt as a result of that in the end. Now, after Jeff's friend offers to step up to take Jeff's place, Jeff finally caves and agrees to go through with it. I also really like how Jeff clarifies how he never said he wouldn't do it, but that he just had some questions about the logistics of it all, which has gotta be a reference to Jesse once telling Walt the same thing during Breaking Bad. We now cut to the evening of the con, and get some subtle foreshadowing of what's to come from the manager of the clothing store noticing a scuff mark on the floor, requesting to have it polished, meaning that it'll get slippery. The manager gets informed of an unexpected delivery, with Jeff's friend Buddy posing as the delivery man. The manager calls who she thinks is his superior, when in reality it's Gene on the other side. Gene takes the call in the back room of Cinnabon and stays vague enough while his co-workers are around in order to not raise any suspicion. Gene manages to convince the manager to leave the 
delivery there overnight, and after he hangs up, he quietly gives himself the it's showtime folks jazz hands in the mirror, referencing the first few episodes of the show, as Jimmy would always do that to himself to hype himself up in the courthouse bathroom before going into court. Gene feels like he still has it, and with all pieces in place, it's now showtime for Gene to distract Frank from the security cameras so Jeff can pull off the heist. Jeff is revealed to have been in the delivery crate and uses the shipping crate to fill his stolen clothes with. Everything starts out fine, but this wouldn't be a proper slip in Jimmy con if something didn't go wrong in the middle of it. Speaking of slip in Jimmy though, as Jeff is on the final stretch, he gets his own unintentional slip in Jimmy moment as he slips and falls on the freshly polished floor, knocking himself out. This causes Gene to improvise in order to distract Frank for longer than expected until Jeff hopefully wakes back up and gets on the move. The con already created enough tension as it was when it was going right, but Jeff knocking himself out on the floor just multiplies the tension as we don't know if Jeff will wake up in time, or even wake up at all for that matter. In order to distract Frank, Gene desperately starts pretending to have a mental breakdown, which unintentionally becomes more real than he initially thought. This is one of the only times that we've ever heard Jimmy slash Saul slash Gene truly speak about his feelings or his family, as he's only doing it for a distraction. Even so, Gene's required to pour out emotions that he's had bottled up for years. He mentions how his parents are both dead, which we learned about during earlier seasons. He mentions how his brother is dead and pauses for a moment while saying so due to this probably being the first time that he's even thought of Chuck in years. He mentions how he doesn't have a wife as Kim left him and he hasn't been willing to find love since, along with having no friends as we witnessed his last true friend Marco dying in the season 1 finale. Gene gets incredibly dark, stating that if he were to die, no one would care and that he'd just be replaced at the Cinnabon. Although Gene doesn't end up dying, spoiler alert, he does disappear due to the events of the final episode, so in a way, he's right in regard to one day just getting replaced. I also love how every time Frank goes to turn around to instinctively look at the cameras, Gene has to just keep egging him on to focus on him instead during this mental breakdown. What? <laughs> look at me! I don't know who I- I don't know what- <laughs> Eventually, Jeff does thankfully wake up and make his way back to pack up the final bits of stolen clothing, then finally hides in the bathroom of the store until it opens the following morning. So when all is said and done, it initially seems suspicious for Gene to never bring the mall cops Cinnabon ever again, but it somewhat makes sense due to Gene's fake mental breakdown being so off-putting that I don't even know if Frank would want to see him on the regular anymore after that, even though he did sound caring and handled the situation to the best of his abilities. So even though we never see Frank, again and we can assume that they naturally would have stopped being friends due to Frank being weirded out over how randomly mentally unstable Gene seems to be, I wonder what Frank's reaction was once Gene was eventually outed as Saul Goodman during the final episode. Did Frank ever find out? It must have been huge news, right? What would he have thought? Hell, what did Gene's Cinnabon employees think? But I digress. The clothing store opens the following morning as usual and Jeff is able to slip out without raising suspicion with everything working out after all. Once Jeff, Buddy, and Gene start unloading the haul that they made in Jeff's shed, Gene reminds them that this is it and that they're cutting ties. In order to make sure that Jeff and Buddy never come after him for more, Gene blackmails them with mutually assured destruction, using his experience as a lawyer to lay out the 30 plus years worth of felonies that they just committed. Jeff and Buddy seem understandably confused by this, as they thought that Gene was their friend, but Gene clears that right up. Man, you don't have to threaten us. We're all friends here. I am not your friend. And if you get greedy and you decide to come back for more, don't. This is just the first of multiple sympathetic moments for Jeff throughout the final episodes, with this kind of being the most low-key of them all, as you can tell that Jeff really does like Gene and did genuinely think of him as a friend. I do, however, like how Gene has now turned the tables on Jeff, intimidating him to say we're done, which has got to be a reference to when Jeff once menacingly told Gene to say Better Call Saul during the Season 5 Gene scene. Just say it. Come on. Come on, man. Say it. Now I need you to say it. We're done. Come on. <laughs> say it. We're done. Say it. Just as Jean concludes business with them, Marion comes over to speak due to noticing Jean's car in her driveway. They manage to cover up their stolen goods under the ruse that Jean is helping Jeff with a vehicle, but as Jean tries leaving, Marion offers Jean inside to wash up and help with the groceries. Here we learn a bit of backstory about Jeff, explaining why he moved away from Albuquerque and back into his mom's house. He apparently got into legal troubles in Albuquerque, which initially makes you think that maybe he got in trouble for doing some sort of criminal activity, when in reality, in the next episode, Marion actually mentions 
mentions how he got arrested for public urination. Gene also admits that he's never been to Albuquerque, which may seem like a throwaway cover-up line for Gene to just distance himself from his secret past, but definitely does come into play later on in the season. Marion calls Gene a good influence on Jeff, when he's obviously the complete opposite, but I feel like Marion says this because even though Gene is secretly a horrible influence on Jeff, he was unintentionally a positive influence on Marion herself, even if Gene only got to know her as a means to an end. When the episode started, Marion refused help from people at the grocery store, even though she could have used Used it. She then reluctantly asked Jean for help when she couldn't make it home, and now by the end of the episode, she happily asked Jean to help her with the groceries, which implies how she's learned that there's no shame in asking for help sometimes, and that you don't need to be so stubborn about it when you clearly need it. Marion then asked Jean if he ever found Nippy, which Jean has obviously already forgotten about. Thinking fast, Jean does manage to come up with an excuse that it was all a false alarm, but again, put a pin in that for later. The episode ends with Jean going to the clothing store during his lunch break the next day, and he picks out a flashy shirt reminiscent of his good old Saul Goodman and Slip and Jimmy days. He doesn't buy it, but it's just another way to imply that he's happy to revert back to his true self. I do really like how since the show's in black and white now, they had to pick out a shirt with a crazy design on it so it would still pop out without any color. This episode gets a strong A tier. Although I do really like this episode, it is probably the weakest out of all the episodes we get during the second half of season 6. Even though it wasn't crazy intense with life and death stakes around every corner, I still appreciate it for what it is, and think that the crazy creators did a great job setting out to accomplish exactly what they wanted to. I can respect them for that, especially in hindsight now that the show is concluded. This episode was fairly controversial when it first aired, simply due to the low stakes that were in it considering the 2 plus years that we've been waiting to see more of Gene, plus having to wait throughout all of season 6 since we never saw him in the premiere. Some people initially felt like it wasn't worth the wait, but looking back on it, I understand why they slowed us down as far as the stakes go for this episode as it is a building episode for the final 3 episodes. I really enjoyed this episode when it first came out, and I like it even more now in retrospect considering how well it sets up the final few episodes of the show. Since some shows have had their endings burn their legacy due to being incredibly rushed from not having enough episodes to properly flush out its conclusions, <coughs> Game, of <coughs> Game of Thrones, I feel like a lot of us instinctively get worried of that happening again when there's only a few episodes left in a show, yet they seem to be doing low-stakes setup episodes instead of blowing us out of the water with every scene. The creators would have never been pissing around with showing Gus at a bar relaxing or showing Gene running around doing silly cons with Jeff if they felt like they were running out of time to conclude their story. They only did all this because they knew they had enough time to properly flesh out the story, as they gave themselves proper room to breathe in order to do so, along with eventually concluding the story the way that they wanted to. Broken record here, but you gotta keep in mind with 607 to 609 acting as its own ending, along with 610 to 613 acting as its own sequel story, the final the four episodes of the show almost feel like they're creating an entirely new show around Gene within an already existing show. I've heard of episodes 610 to 613 getting compared to El Camino as far as it being Saul's post-breaking bad sequel story, even going as far as to call it Gene Camino or El Cagino if you will. But enough rambling, let's keep the ball rolling into the next installment of El Cagino. Season 6 Episode 11 Breaking Bad. This episode starts out with a missing scene elaborating on Walt and Jesse kidnapping Saul and bringing him out into the desert during Breaking Bad 208, which was Saul's first ever episode. I really like how the first episode that Saul is in in Breaking Bad is titled Better Call Saul, while the first episode that Walt and Jesse are in in Better Call Saul is titled Breaking Bad. It's one prediction I made years ago that I'm really happy actually happened. Also, since I'm such a huge It Wasn't Me It Was Ignacio fanboy, I absolutely love how the creators gave it some love in this episode and fleshed it out more. Better Call Saul has referenced Saul's first Breaking Bad episode many times, with this being another to add to the list as it always creates a nice full circle feeling where Saul's character originated from. I really like how they elaborate Saul's PTSD as we witness him getting kidnapped from his own perspective. They've already set up more of why Saul has this PTSD surrounding Nacho and Lalo due to the events of episode 608, and now we see it come to fruition as we jump right into the iconic Breaking Bad moment. He starts yelling out Yo Soy Abogado in reference to Better Call Saul 508 Bagman, along was saying it anywhere but in the desert in reference to not only Bagman but also episode 102 of Better Call Saul, considering the last time he was kidnapped he was brought out into the desert by Tuco and Nacho. Saul yelling out that they can fix this with De Niro also reminds me of the skater twins trying to say the same thing to Tuco's Abuelita in episode 102 as well. This is also a setup for not only another missing scene during the same situation later on in the episode, but also two more missing scenes after that, so I'll talk about it more in just a moment, but what I will say is that I love how as soon as we get the establishing shots, we instantly know that we're in Walt and Jesse's RV, aka the Crystal Ship, as Jesse likes to call it. Crystal Ship definitely travels. 
sorry. You said the what? Travels? Crystal Schiff. What do I call this thing? But back in the 2010 Gene timeline, after the intro sequence, we catch up with how Francesca's been post Breaking Bad. We learn that she's a landlord for two incredibly cliche and stupid stoners who blatantly deny the obvious in the most man child way possible. To be honest, these guys give stoners a bad name, and I'll leave it at that before we go into a huge rabbit hole about it, but I feel bad for Francesca having to put up with this, although she's clearly put up with a lot worse in the past few years. Francesca checks the clock, realizing it's almost 3 p.m., so she leaves to go make the iconic phone call that Saul had set up for her during the Better Call Saul 405 flash forward cold open. I absolutely love how we get a fleshed out answer to this mystery that's made us theorize over it for like three years. Saul wanted Francesca to make this call on his birthday because it's actually him that she's calling in order to catch him up on what's happened ever since he's gone into hiding since Jean hasn't had contact with anyone from Albuquerque since he's disappeared. Francesca of course doesn't do this out of the kindness of her heart however as she's only there for a large cash sum that Saul had promised. Her. She even sits there hoping that the payphone won't ring, but when it does, she reluctantly answers it. Fun fact, the gas station that Francesca takes the call at is actually the same gas station that Hank tracked Jesse bribing the employee with drugs at. So Saul tries getting information out of her first, but when she says she's just gonna leave, he caves and tells her where the money is, leading her to a fishing line near a drain pipe. She pulls out the money and returns to the phone to tell Saul that it's all there. Next up, Saul asks her how hot she is, which is a reference that I really like as it's a callback to what Ed would say to his clients once they requested to be disappeared. Francesca tells him that she's still being watched by the government as she still gets followed, her phones are tapped, and her mail gets opened before she even looks at it. We actually saw her possibly getting followed on her way to take this very phone call, which is why we saw her take a wrong turn and do a huge loop before finally returning to the same intersection to this time turn the correct way now that she knows that no one is tailing her. We get updates on various Breaking Bad characters as well, giving them each their own conclusion. Francesca informs Saul that Skylar took the deal with the feds, meaning that Walt's phone call did end up working out in her favor. We also get confirmation that Jesse's car was found by the border, which is a reference to El Camino as this takes place months after the events of it. This also means that Jesse presumably is still making a new quiet life for himself in Alaska since the feds haven't found him and think that he fled to Mexico. Buell is apparently back in New Orleans, confirming that he was able to walk after the DEA held him under false pretenses, but we have no idea where Kubi is. We did learn that all of Saul's money laundering businesses have been caught and seized by the feds, including the nail salons and even the laser take place where Saul's Danny worked at, which was confirmed by Tom Schnoss to be Daniel Price Wormald. Saul also apparently had an offshore bank account with $850,000 in it that he left in Francesca's name, but since he never told her about it, she instantly gave it up to the feds as she didn't appreciate being left to hold the literal bag all on her own. Francesca tells Saul that Bill Oakley switched from a prosecutor to a defense attorney, and by the looks of it, he's taking a few pages out of Saul's book, considering that we saw Francesca drive past a bus stop advertising advertisement of Oakley, reminiscent of the Saul Goodman bus stop ads that we saw during Breaking Bad, primarily Saul's first episode, Breaking Bad 208. This is also set up for the final episode of the show, so put a pin in that for now. When Saul finally accepts that there's nothing else to talk about, Francesca can tell how he's depressed over it, so she gives him one final piece of information to potentially cheer him up. She tells him that after everything went down, Kim called her to check in on her, and that she mentioned Jimmy by name. This is also the final time that we ever see Francesca on the show, but I'm glad that we got closure of her character in this way, as it is rare to see any main or side characters at all during the black and white 2010 era. And I can't state this enough. I really like how the reveal of this secret phone call set up from way back in 405 gives us a huge lore dump in regards to fates of many characters post Breaking Bad, since the post Breaking Bad gene timeline has always been the most mysterious era that we've always had the least amount of information about. Due to this, I really don't mind all the exposition that Francesca is telling Saul, as it works perfectly in universe since Saul specifically set up this exact phone call for that very reason. In my opinion, this is one of the many successful ways to do exposition correctly, as it's an answer to a huge mystery that we've been wondering about for years now. So since Gene now knows that Kim asked about him, wondering if he's still even alive or what, it makes Gene ponder whether or not to just mind his own business and stay in hiding, or if he should try to make contact with Kim. This is represented perfectly by Gene stopping at a literal crossroad as he's driving back from the payphone, followed by us instantly cutting to him back at the payphone, revealing that he's made up his mind and that he's going to try and contact Kim. It turns out that Gene has always known where Kim has moved to and what company she works for, since she did so while he was still Saul Goodman, but he hasn't tried contacting her ever since he went into hiding until now due to him being in fear that it's not safe to. He does manage to get through to her, but we don't hear the conversation, at least not
not yet, as we only know how it ended badly considering the way that Jean becomes incredibly angry about it as the call ends. Learning where Kim has been during the events of Breaking Bad and even afterwards has been a huge mystery throughout the entire run of Better Call Saul, so it's a big deal learning that she's apparently moved to Florida, but more on that in the next episode. Gene goes back to work at Cinnabon, but as he lets his negative phone call with Kim sink in, it's appeared to open old wounds as he can't leave well enough alone, and is shown to be sick and tired of living an isolated life in hiding. As we know, he became Saul Goodman in order to distract himself from being alone with his thoughts, so Gene now does the same thing by returning to Jeff to Conmore in order to get his mind off of things. We see Jeff return home, confused to see Gene's car on the side of the road, and then enters his home once again to see Gene hanging out with Marion, this time with Marion showing Gene the new laptop that Jeff bought her. As as Jean and Jeff go out to speak in private, Marion seems a bit suspicious that Jean wants to just run off with Jeff in such a hurry, but we'll put a pin in that for now. Jeff is worried that Jean is mad at him for buying Marion a laptop, and although that's not a concern for Jean currently, it winds up ironically playing a large part in his downfall, which we'll bring up when the time comes. For now though, Jean starts questioning and understandably confused Jeff about his job and what hours he works. Jean has seemingly skipped the first part of what should be their conversation involving Jean wanting to con with Jeff again, as Jean just cuts straight to the planning phase as he already knows that Jeff will want to be in on it. It's really a heartwarming moment seeing how almost giddy Jeff feels at the idea of working alongside Jean Jean again, as they cheers their drinks in agreement that they're back in business. We then jump to Jean singing karaoke in a classically wonderful and tone-deaf Bob Odenkirk fashion, revealing that he's trying to talk up the first mark for their next scam. Jean plays dumb with this guy, allowing him to outsmart Jean with a few bar tricks, when in reality, Jean is purposely trying to get this guy nice and drunk while Jean secretly sucks up his drinks through a tube in his sleeve. Another hint that Jean is doing this to distract himself from Kim and live up his glory con days is the fact that the alias that he uses while introducing himself to these marks is Victor with a K, which is his fake name that he used alongside Kim's Giselle St. Clair when they used to con together. So as Jean leaves the bar with this mark, a cab pulls up right at the perfect time as it turns out to be Jeff arriving right on cue. Jean glances at it to make sure that it's Jeff and then allows the mark to take the cab first in order to progress onto the next part of the plan. During the drive back home, Jeff offers the man some water in order to hydrate, when in reality the water secretly has the barbiturates that Jean talked about getting beforehand with Jeff. Jeff gets a call from Buddy over the cab radio pretending to be his dispatcher so Jeff can tell him where the Mark's home address is, and then when Jeff helps the Mark into his house due to being so drunk, he leaves duct tape on the door frame so that it won't lock. Once Jeff successfully pulls this off, I love how you can see the happiness and excitement on his face that he did a job well done, showing that he does truly enjoy conning with Gene. Turns out that Gene is handpicking Marks who are wealthy single men living alone and drugging them so that Jeff's friend can sneak into their house while they're passed out with the ruse that he's walking walking his dog in order to steal their identities by taking photos of sensitive information including their IDs, bank cards, passwords, etc. I also like the misdirect of how you initially think that Buddy's just gonna rob the mark when he first takes out his wallet, as it looks like Buddy's gonna steal the money out of it. One of the best parts of watching characters execute cons in this show is trying to figure out what their goal is while it's happening and then getting that aha moment once you figure it out. So we then get a short break from the Gene Identity Theft Cons sponsored by yet another Breaking Bad missing scene, continuing what we saw in the cold open. See, the cold open shows what happened directly before the Breaking Bad scene of Walt and Jesse kidnapping Saul and bringing him out into the desert, while this second missing scene shows what happens after they talk things out, ready to return to town. This of course is the iconic debut of Walt and Jesse appearing in Better Call Saul for the first time, which was a highly anticipated moment ever since really the conception of Better Call Saul. If they were ever going to do it, now's the time, so I'm happy that they did. It's amazing how well both Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul slid back into their roles as Walt and Jesse, along with the fact that Tom Schnoss did an excellent job picking back up writing the characters as if he never stopped. The bickering between them as soon as they get in the RV is great, along with Walt constantly belittling Jesse and becoming frustrated with his antics just makes you feel like you're right at home with the original show. Since this of course happens during season 2 of Breaking Bad, is before too much crazy stuff happens to Walt or Jesse, allowing them to play more laid back and light hearted versions of the characters. Also, since they're giving Saul a ride back into town, this time without a bag over his head, we get to see his reaction witnessing the inside of the RV for the first time. He instantly puts two and two together and realizes that this is where they cook, making him realize that Walt is in fact Heisenberg. 
Walt initially tells Jesse no details and that Saul's on a need-to-know basis, but Jesse gives Walt a hard time, stating that since he's standing in front of a lab, he's gonna put two and two together, all with the fact that Jesse didn't even want to originally show his face to Saul, referencing the Breaking Bad scene. Another reference to the Breaking Bad scene is the fact that Saul tells them how their attorney-client privilege doesn't only cover the Badger being arrested situation, but also extends to any other matter involving their criminal activities. I also love how Saul picks up a huge flask and jokes about how he once had a fish that could have used it as a vacation home, referencing the iconic fish that he had throughout most of the show during the 2004 era. Since this of course happens in 2008, that fish is sadly long dead, rest in peace, but even so we get a little homage to the fish considering that the teaser poster for this episode is literally the fish swimming in the flask. So Saul tries talking business, wondering how much they can cook in a single batch, but Walt cuts off his questions, telling him to focus on getting Badger out of jail. Walt seems reluctant to pay Saul the $80,000 fee, calling it a starting point of negotiation, but Saul just casually tells him that he can take it any way he wants, but that's the price. It's kind of wild how casual Saul is around both of them considering they just had him at gunpoint in front of an open grave, but just goes to show that this isn't his first rodeo when it comes to being kidnapped and brought out into the desert or being held at gunpoint either. Also, considering the people that have done this to Saul in the past, Walt and Jesse are definitely the most reasonable out of them. A perfect example of this is looking to the actual Breaking Bad scene itself, since once Walt and Jesse imply to Saul that they're not the cartel by telling him to just speak English, he lines up and instantly feels relieved, easily able to use his big mouth to talk himself out of the situation and speak to Walt and Jesse on even ground. So as they sit down in the RV to leave, they have trouble starting it, foreshadowing Walt and Jesse getting stuck out in the desert during what would be the very next episode of Breaking Bad, Season 2, Episode 9, Four Days Out. We even see the red light turn off when Walt takes the keys out of the ignition, referencing how Jesse leaves the keys in the ignition during Breaking Bad 209, which causes them to get stuck out in the desert in the first place. As they sit and wait for the RV to work, in order to pass the time, Jesse tries making small talk by asking Saul who Lalo is. Saul dodges the questions, he definitely doesn't want to bring up memories of Lalo or even explain who he is, along with the fact that by this point, Saul had most likely already forgotten that he even mentioned Lalo due to it being sort of an instinctive PTSD reaction. So Saul changes the subject by asking Walt to try and start the RV again in order to get out of there as quickly as possible so he doesn't have to avoid any more questions about Lalo. And when the RV successfully turns on, Jesse gives Walt a sarcastic bravo, which may or may not be a reference to the Bravo Vince Breaking Bad meme. As they turn the RV around and drive away, the camera then zooms in on the empty grave that they dug for Saul, with the show now giving an incredible transition to Gene laying in his bed, but in such a way that it looks like Gene is laying in the grave. So back in the 2010 Gene era, Gene receives a package on his doorstep which is revealed to be a swing master just like the one that he had as Saul, showing how he's really trying to relive his glory days even though it seems like an itch that he can't quite scratch. We get another conning montage of them doing this identity theft scheme over and over, and the montage includes a fun little easter egg showing a picture of Tom Schnoz as one of the stolen identities since this episode was both written and directed by Tom and is also his final episode working on the show. The montage song is a great cover of Tapioca Tundra and it just fits so well. I really love how much care the creators put into choosing music for the show, along with even going so far as to commission custom covers as well. I just wish that there's a soundtrack that had all the specialized covers of the songs used in the show, such as the special version of Something Stupid from 509, the custom version of Wine and Roses from 601, all the custom version of Perfect Day from 609. Another thing hinting at the fact that Gene is doing these identity theft cons due to being upset over his phone call with Kim is the fact of how hateful this con really is. All of the cons during the earlier seasons seemed way more lighthearted compared to this just as a way to make a quick buck or get what he wants, but this identity theft con seems straight up heinous and spiteful. Gene's getting people drunk, drugging them, breaking into their houses while they sleep, and stealing their identities. It's also not like Gene needs to recoup his losses after learning from Francesca that his money laundering businesses and offshore bank accounts were seized, as he still has that bag full of diamonds if he ever really needed money. So as we once again see Gene by himself at Cinnabon, you can tell that starting up conning with Jeff again really hasn't truly fixed anything, as Gene still feels just as bad as when we saw him in this position earlier on in the episode. Now you initially don't feel too bad for the marks, considering Gene seems to be picking marks that are a-holes, such as the prick that kept messing with Gene with his bar tricks, but when Gene wants to con a perfectly polite man with cancer, Gene definitely crosses the line in 
an inexcusable way. Also, side note, apologies for just calling this character the guy with cancer or the cancer mark, but we never really get an official name for him. So Jean still wanting to rob this poor man shows that Jean is filled with malice and hatred and nothing else. It's as if he's mad at the world and just wants to hurt as many people as he can, regardless of who they are or what their situation may be. Not only does this guy seem like a genuinely good person, which is a huge contrast to the mark that we saw Jean with at the bar earlier on, but then add the fact that he has cancer on top of it, this really shows that Jean doesn't have a single sympathetic bone left in his body. But we then take another break from our regularly scheduled Jean programming to jump back into yet another missing scene that happens during Breaking Bad 208, this time with Mike going to speak to Saul in his office. We can see Saul using a swing master as Mike walks in, which is obviously a direct parallel to Jean ordering himself one just moments ago in the same episode. We did see Saul using the swing master during Breaking Bad itself, but I feel like they put this in here just in case you didn't remember, they just kind of wanted to hit that on the nose. Now I think this missing scene with Mike and Saul is incredibly interesting due to us seeing Mike during the Breaking Bad timeline, but before his first ever appearance since this missing scene happens during Breaking Bad 208, when Mike doesn't get introduced as a character until Breaking Bad 213. Yet another thing that I theorized about before Season 6 came out, so I'm happy that we actually got to see it. So here we see that Mike is still accepting PI work for Saul, since Saul is a great connection to have after taking over Caldera's job, and out of all the targets that Saul hired Mike to gather intel on, the most most notable of them is obviously Walt himself. Mike is revealed to be the PI that Saul mentioned he hired in 208 to find out about Walt, with us actually seeing Mike now reporting back to Saul with the information. Saul learns that Walt is a high school chemistry teacher, that his partner Jesse is his former student, and that he has cancer. Even though Saul is eager to work with Walt due to seeing him as someone who can be molded into a money-making machine, Mike strongly insists against it and tells Saul to steer clear of Walt as he's incredibly amateur and will get arrested or killed before the cancer can even catch up with him. Saul pretends to agree, but zones out as Mike goes over the rest of the information that he gathered about other targets, implying that all Saul can think about is working with Walt. Although I like seeing Mike and Saul still working together years later during the Breaking Bad era, especially after everything we've now seen them go through together during Better Call Saul, it's interesting how differently Mike treats Saul. It's almost as if the Jimmy that he once knew is already dead, so he's become jaded towards him. Now, to be honest, I've already talked about this scene to death in multiple other videos, including including an entire video dedicated to it, along with my recent Mike retrospective, so I'll have both of those linked in the description in case you're at all interested. So although Gene is still willing to go through with conning that nice man that he met who just so happens to have cancer, we learn that Buddy does feel sympathy towards the man as he bailed on the mark once he broke into the house and saw that the guy had pills meant to treat cancer in his home. As Gene takes the call informing him of this, we see that he's also back to using a Bluetooth earpiece just like he did as Saul. Just like with the Swing Master, the earpiece is yet an another hint at the fact that Gene is reverting back into Saul, but this time a more heartless and spiteful version of him. So Gene meets Jeff and Buddy in Jeff's garage, but Marion notices them due to Gene being sloppy and not even considering Marion as an actual threat whatsoever. This adds to the idea of Marion being suspicious of Gene, as it seems like there's more to him than she originally thought due to how rude he's being to Jeff and Buddy when he tells them to get in the garage, on top of the fact that he's even suspiciously meeting with Jeff and Buddy so late at night in the first place. So Gene freaks out at Buddy, bailing on the mark, but Buddy defends his actions to bail as it hits too close to home for him due to his father having cancer and needing to take the same kind of pills. Gene downplays the fact that the mark has cancer with the idea that someone can still be an a-hole even if they do have cancer, even though Gene knows that this guy is actually a really polite and genuine dude. This is definitely Gene thinking of Walt still being an a-hole even with cancer, which is an interesting parallel considering that we just saw the missing scene of when Saul was first told about Walt's cancer from Mike. So Buddy puts his foot down on not wanting to rip off a guy with cancer, and I think the actor for Buddy just does such a great job giving a genuine reaction. Hot take here, but uh, I definitely agree with Buddy. Wild stance, I know. So Gene is irrationally hell-bent on ripping off this cancer mark, when there's clearly more fish in the sea. They've stolen countless identities at this point, so it realistically shouldn't matter if they let one go, as there will be many more to come anyways. Gene tries defending his case by seeing how hard it is to find a perfect mark, but to be honest, boohoo, go cry me a river. Gene even tries convincing Buddy by telling him that he'll eventually stop feeling guilty over it and forget all about it, which almost seems like a completely botched paraphrasing of the advice that he told Kim in the beginning of 609 that Mike once told him. You can really tell how corrupted Gene is at this point, especially since he's seemingly trying to corrupt Buddy and Jeff to stoop to his levels, wanting them to lose any sort of sympathy or morals that they have. This also really continues the idea of Gene's spiteful and hateful nature this episode that I discussed earlier. 
Buddy admits that he already pulled the tape off of the door so they couldn't even get back in if they wanted to. Buddy then asks Jeff to back him up, but although Jeff definitely agrees with him, he's indecisive on taking sides and just kind of fence sits as he doesn't want to lose Gene as a mentor slash partner again. Gene ends up firing Buddy from the crew, instantly showing the main reason why Jeff didn't want to side with Buddy. I really like how when Jeff is surprised that Gene still wants to go through with this in the first place, Gene gives Jeff the same ultimatum that he did in 610 when Jeff was having doubts, are you in or out? Since Jeff must have told Gene that he's in, Gene gets Jeff to drive him back to the Cancer Mark's house and tells Jeff to pick him up in like 20 minutes. Jeff seems understandably unsure about all this due to being able to tell that Gene is being irrational, but Gene insists that everything will be fine. As Gene exits Jeff's cab, we get another missing scene from Breaking Bad 208, this time showing Saul exiting his Cadillac and walking into Walt's school to speak to him, which is the conversation that we see at the end of Breaking Bad 208. Speaking of which, the episode ends with Saul walking into the high school paralleled by Gene breaking into the Cancer Mark's house, and the episode cuts. This episode gets a double S tier, there's just so much about it that I love. Obviously, there's all the Breaking Bad missing scenes, calling back to the iconic It Wasn't Me, It Was Ignacio ordeal, which is extremely important in many ways for both shows. Having Walt and Jesse finally appear in the show was amazing, blatant fan service aside. The cameos work out well due to them relating back to the whole story of Better Call Saul, along with emphasizing how important the It Wasn't Me, It Was Ignacio ordeal is. Saul's first episode in Breaking Bad has always been extremely important to the creation of Better Call Saul, along with obviously Saul's character in general, so it makes sense that they would do so many callbacks and references to it. Mike advising Saul not to work with Walt also gives a lot more underlying subtext to what happens in Breaking Bad as well. I really like this parallel of Saul going in to speak to Walt, compared to Gene going to break into the Cancer Mark's house, as both are equally bad decisions that Gene slash Saul has made slash is currently making. This definitely emphasizes how Saul went to work with Walt against Mike's advice, and if Saul would have only taken Mike's advice, essentially none of the events of Breaking Bad seasons 3 to 5 would have happened, but that's another what if hypothetical for another time. Bottom line, it turns out that Mike was right about Walt being bad news, but again, I discussed that more in my Mike retrospective in regard to Mike's opinions of Walt in general. The main idea to take away from this parallel at the end of the episode, though, is that Jimmy can never stop getting in his own way. This entire episode has been Gene going down a self-destructive path due to his past surfacing after his bad phone call with Kim, and the Breaking Bad missing scene flashbacks simply imply that this isn't the first time that Jimmy slash Saul slash Gene has made bad decisions, even against the advice of the people that he surrounds himself with. Saul didn't listen to Mike's advice to not work with Walt, and Gene didn't listen to Jeff and Buddy's advice not to return to the Cancer Mark's house. When it comes down to it, Saul's his own worst enemy, and this episode really does a great job at highlighting it. Now, as far as the Gene stuff goes, I really like all that too. You've already heard me gush over how much I love the Francesca phone call, which not only answers the question of the 405 phone call mystery, but is also a perfect vessel to give viewers tons of exposition in regard to many characters post-Breaking Bad. The whole mysterious Kim phone call causing Gene to relapse as Saul, in an incredibly spiteful and hateful self-destructive way, is also incredibly interesting. From seeing how happy Jeff was to work alongside Gene again, to how Buddy rationally bails out of ripping off a man with cancer, I love the whole ride, and especially enjoy the final confrontation between Gene and Buddy where Gene fires him due to his irrational and self-destructive thinking. The final three episodes are also written and directed by each of the main creators of the show, giving them each one big final send-off respectively. 611 is written and directed by Tom Schnoz, 612 is written and directed by Vince Gilligan, and 613 is written and directed by Peter Gould. Considering this episode is both written and directed by Tom Schnoz, no wonder I love it so much, since I seem to love pretty much any episode that Tom has ever had a major part in. 109, 201, 302, 304, 307, 402, 410, 509, 607, and now 611. All complete bangers. If Tom is writing and or directing any given episode, you know it's gonna be really good. Season 6 Episode 12, Waterworks. This episode starts out in the early Saul Goodman era between both shows around 2005, as Saul procrastinates having to see Kim to sign their divorce papers. I feel like half of it is Saul not wanting to have to face Kim, with the other half being purposely making her wait out of spite. 
Francesca calls him to complain that he's taking so long as it's been an hour and there's still a full waiting room of clients out there alongside Kim. Here we get to see more of the dysfunctional workplace relationship between Saul and Francesca, considering Saul implies how he could simply replace her if she keeps complaining, followed by her calling him out over the fact that everyone in the waiting room can hear him bouncing around his stress ball, which has got to be a reference to when Jimmy bounced around stress balls out of boredom at CC Mobile back in Season 4. I love how the styrofoam pillar falls over when Saul accidentally hits it with the stress ball, as it's just as fake as his entire persona. Saul eventually sighs and tells Francesca to send Kim in, but more on that later on in the episode. For now, we're back in the Gene era as we pick up not where the last episode ended off, with instead getting the huge Kim in Florida reveal. I was incredibly shocked when I first saw this episode, especially considering how different Kim purposely looks. Speaking of which, I'm sorry, but this style just doesn't suit her. I get that it takes a while to get used to change, but I just don't think I'll ever get used to how Florida Kim looks. Although that hairstyle isn't a bad one, it does kind of look bad on her. Also, what the heck is with that jean skirt? I digress though, enough roasting as Kim has clearly already been through enough. So we catch up with Kim and we see that she's in a relationship and a sad one at that if their traumatizing yelp sex scene has anything to say about it. I can't believe that Kim is banging someone who sounds almost exactly like her ex-boss Kevin, but I'd rather not get into that. Seeing Kim's life in Florida is incredibly sad and pathetic, as it seems like she's torturing herself for her past involving Howard and Lalo. It's interesting how although Kim never needed to go into hiding or anything, she still chose to relocate and isolate herself in a similar manner to Saul changing his identity to Jean. It really is a great parallel in regards to them both being tortured to live small and insignificant new lives after their old lives in Albuquerque. The fact that we see Kim's life in Florida in black and white as well really brings the parallel together considering that they're both living unhappy lives as punishment for their past. The thing is though, Saul disappeared as Jean in 2010, so he's only even been Jean for a few months, whereas Kim moved to Florida around 2005, so she's been doing this for like 5 plus years longer. Kim is also tragically gone from someone who righteously always wants to make her own decisions to someone who never can. After what happened to Kim in Albuquerque, she almost seems afraid to make any of her own decisions anymore, no matter how insignificant. Over and over again, we see her boyfriend and co-workers ask her for opinions about different mundane topics and she can never give a straight answer. She can't decide if she wants to use Miracle Whip in her potato salad, she doesn't give any input when her boyfriend is talking about Survivor, she can't pick out a flavor ice cream for her co-workers, and the job that she has at Palm Coast Sprinklers requires no decision making either. It's essentially just her working on mind-numbing documents as if she's purposely put herself in doc review, which as we know was the punishment that Howard gave her back when she still worked at HHM in Season 2. It's a really sad existence for her that she chooses to put upon herself, never able to forgive herself for her past or let go of it, as if she feels like she doesn't deserve any better. She's truly living the most safe yet generic life imaginable, which is an insult for her character considering how smart of a person she truly is. I actually really like how when her boyfriend's just watching TV, she appears to be doing a monochromatic puzzle, as it's one of the only things that she can do to truly stimulate her brain after being dulled down from her boring day to day. It's almost as if her life in Albuquerque was so eventful that the tragic ending to it scared Kim out of having any excitement in her life ever again. Watching Kim's life in Florida has such an eerie and uncanny valley feeling to it that makes me feel like I'm in Tranquility Lane from Fallout 3, especially when we see her and her co-workers singing one of them happy birthday after the phone call with Jimmy, which I guess we'll go ahead and jump into. So while Kim is at work, we see her get a surprise phone call from Jean, giving us the full context of the mysterious Kim phone call from the last episode. The alias that Jean calls himself when calling into Kim's work is Victor St. Clair, so when Kim hears that, she instantly knows that it's really Jimmy. I can't stress enough how caught off guard Kim must feel by this phone call, especially after not seeing Saul for like 5 years, along with the fact that he has been missing for the past few months ever since everything that happened surrounding the ending to Breaking Bad. As Kim closes off her office in order to take the phone call privately, she clearly hesitates picking up the phone due to thoughts of her past life in Albuquerque all rushing back to her after bottling it up for so long. You can really tell how anxious she is as she picks up the phone shown by her shaking due to the adrenaline probably running through her body, most likely giving her a fight or flight response. Jimmy tries creating conversation to catch up as if nothing ever happened, but Kim is just so shocked from the out of the blue phone call that she's pretty much completely speechless, only asking him what he wants after she makes sure that her receptionist isn't listening into her phone call. 
this phone call really gives off the perfectly awkward vibe of portraying the idea of randomly picking up the phone and calling your ex after like half a decade, as there's so much history between them that it's hard to just have a normal conversation and catch up as old friends, especially considering the way things ended, on top of the fact that Jimmy's literally in hiding as Gene, which adds another layer to it. Speaking of which, Gene can tell that Kim isn't up for small talk, so he jumps straight to the chase and states how he just wanted to let her know that he's still alive in case she was wondering. Jimmy obviously says this due to the fact that Francesca told him that Kim asked about him, implying that she does wonder if he's even still alive. Jimmy tries lightening the mood by joking about how he's still getting away with it considering he's on the run and in hiding, but this has just got to be about the worst thing that he could have said, all things considered. Kim is literally in her self-created purgatory due to feeling immense guilt over what happened, and here comes Jimmy bragging about getting away with everything he's been a part of and not facing any consequences. As you can imagine, this strikes a nerve for Kim, as the only thing that she can muster up to say is to tell Jimmy that he should turn himself in. Granted, Jimmy did just mention how she can even yell at him if she wants, implying that he doesn't care if she only has negative things to say to him, as he just wants to talk to her that badly no matter the topic. Even with that in mind, I bet her telling him to turn himself in is probably the last thing he expected her to say. Also, as a side note, Jimmy telling Kim that she can yell at him just wanting her to say something reminds me a lot of Breaking Bad when Hank was trying to convince Skylar to talk to Marie again after Skylar kept ignoring her calls over her unable to admit that she stole that baby tiara. Anyways, it's interesting how the only things that Jimmy and Kim can say to each other both strike a nerve within each other as Kim gets annoyed at Jimmy bragging about not getting caught for his crimes, while Jimmy gets annoyed at Kim suggesting that he should turn himself in after everything he's gone through to not get caught. This parallel works really well because the reason why these back and forth remarks bother them so much is the fact that they have no idea what they've both been respectively going through. Jimmy has no idea that Kim has created a living hell for herself as punishment over Howard and Lalo, and Kim has no idea how Jimmy had to literally change his identity and live in a depressing isolation in order to keep the heat off of himself. Jimmy childishly and instantly becomes angrily defensive as he pleads ignorance, saying that she doesn't know what he did or didn't do. He also deflects right back at her, accusing her of being the one who should turn herself in since she's the one with a conscience, which really hits home for her as we'll see momentarily in the episode. Jimmy elaborates on how she could hypothetically turn herself in now without any fear of repercussions due to Gus and Mike now both being dead, as they were the ones who made Jimmy and Kim stay quiet about what truly happened to Howard. I do like the detail of how when Jimmy lists off Gus and Mike, he also mentions Lalo in an unsure manner, Tiffy's actually dead, continuing the theme of Jimmy's trauma slash PTSD not allowing him to truly ever accept the fact that Lalo is indeed dead. As Jimmy continues to get himself more and more worked up, he eventually realizes how he probably shouldn't be yelling at her and tries backpedaling, but to no avail. He even says how they're both too smart to throw their lives away by turning themselves in, but we'll just put a pin in that for later. With Kim unable to say anything else to Jimmy, she just says that she's happy he's alive and hangs up. This shows that regardless of their history or the petty arguments that they're having over the phone, that in the end, she does still care for him, which just makes this so much more tragic. She also probably thought that this could have been the last thing that she would have potentially ever said to him, so it makes sense that she'd conclude their conversation with a remark like that before hanging up. Now we understand why Gene became so frustrated last episode after his mysterious phone call with Kim, as we've now heard how it ended so poorly. It's tragically realistic to consider that after all the years that they've spent apart, that this is how a conversation between them turns out. After all that time alone, potentially contemplating all the things that they want to say to each other or wish that they could have in the past, just for it to end negatively in an argument due to emotions getting the best of them is insanely relatable in such a depressing way. So we then see Kim returning to Albuquerque to turn herself in, and as she leaves the Albuquerque airport, we get yet another shot-by-shot -shot parallel between Kim and Walt. First, we saw Kim walking up to Gus's house in 608, being a direct parallel to Walt doing the same thing in Breaking Bad 402, and now we see Kim's silhouette at the Albuquerque airport being a direct parallel to Walt in the exact same spot in Breaking Bad 209. There's also the whole Walter White comparison as far as being given an ultimatum to solve your problems legitimately versus criminally, but I already discussed that to death during my Kim Ruined Her Own Dreams video that I have linked in the description as I mentioned earlier. There's also a possible El Camino reference while Kim's at the airport, as the sign right next to her says Alaska, which is where Jesse is supposedly hiding out in this exact moment. Anyways, we see Kim bring her confession letter to the courthouse, and it must be eerie for her to walk those halls again after so long. She unintentionally takes a walk down memory lane due to having so many significant moments of her life happen there. As she walks to the courthouse, she walks past the same outside tables that she once sat at with Jimmy when they were waiting to get married. 
I wonder if she was worried of running into someone that she knew, and I can only imagine of how that would have gone down if she did. She also notices an up and coming lawyer helping out what's probably a pro bono client, which is obviously meant to be a parallel of Kim herself, making her think of her past life as a lawyer with this new woman almost unintentionally filling her shoes. I also really like how when Kim first arrived at the courthouse, the show hinted at what she was doing there due to Kim looking at the toll booth as she drove into the parking lot with her obviously thinking of Mike. The toll booth being empty due to it now being automated is symbolism of the fact that Kim is most likely now only turning herself in due to the fact that Mike is dead, along with the fact that Mike's ghost has been unintentionally haunting her for some time now as she still thought that Gus and Mike were still alive until Jimmy recently told her otherwise. But enough hidden details and references, let's discuss the elephant in the room already, which is obviously the fact that Kim is taking Jimmy's advice and literally turning herself in even if he never really meant it. I assume that Kim has wanted to turn herself in and face the consequences of her actions for a while, but hasn't been able to due to knowing that Gus and or Mike would come after her for being a rat. This is most likely why she was torturing herself with this self-inflicted purgatory as punishment since she thought that she wasn't able to face legal punishment that she feels like she deserves. Now that Jimmy has told her that both Mike and Gus are dead, there isn't really anything else stopping Kim from turning herself in any longer. So that, along with the way that the phone call with Jimmy turned out, must have motivated Kim to actually go and turn herself in, as we see here. I assume that Kim also didn't want to turn herself in due to not wanting to implicate Jimmy, but now that he's on the run as a wanted man, along with outright telling her to turn herself in, I guess that she doesn't have to worry about implicating him any longer. Also, thinking back to how Jimmy told her that they're too smart to throw their lives away was more personal to Kim than Jimmy was aware of. Kim isn't really living much of a life in Florida, so it's not like she really even has anything to throw away that she cares about. Plus, she already threw away her actual life that she had in Albuquerque, so throwing away her Florida life in comparison isn't that big of a deal. So after giving her confession statement to the courthouse, she then brings another copy of it to Cheryl, Howard's widow. This scene with Cheryl is incredibly shocking and tense, as this is the moment that we learn what Kim is really doing in Albuquerque, which is of course turning herself in and giving Cheryl her statement of what truly happened to Howard. Although it was kind of easy to guess what Kim was doing at the courthouse beforehand, we weren't initially supposed to outright know why she was there as we were left in the dark up until this scene with Cheryl. I like how Cheryl is still shown to be wearing her wedding ring, tragically showing how she still hasn't gotten over Howard's death, with her being a perfect example of the cliche of you don't truly realize what you have until it's gone. I love how well this scene is shot and edited together by showing Cheryl's reaction to reading the confession letter as the camera zooms in on the confession letter sentence by sentence and eventually word by word. It does a great job by giving the viewer enough time to focus on and read the important details of it without having to pause or rewind. Kim informs Cheryl that although the police will search for Howard's body, she doesn't think that they'll find it, which is most likely true since the DEA never found the bodies of Howard and Lalo when they searched the super lab after Walt and Jesse blew it up. And before I get comments saying otherwise, no, sadly the two bodies that were found there weren't Howard and Lalo, they are actually just two nameless guards that Walt had killed while freeing Jesse. Now I love how Cheryl calls out Kim for saying that Howard didn't suffer, since ruining his reputation caused him tremendous stress while he was still alive, and it ruined his legacy in death. Although Kim says that she wants to change the way that people remember Howard, that's easier said than done. Even if she could prove what she states in her confession, it could never undo the years of damage to his reputation that spread far and wide. No matter what truth comes to light, there will always be people who just think of Howard as a drug addict. So although Kim mentions Jimmy in her confession letter, she still covers for him being in hiding as she tells Cheryl that she has no idea if Jimmy is even still alive. Considering Jimmy's fate in the next and final episode, I wonder if he'd ever be able to be used to confirm Kim's confession as true. Let me know what you think as that may be a theory for a future video. Kim says that since there's no evidence of what really happened, all of her being the only remaining witness, she doesn't think that anything will come of her confession statement. Cheryl says how she could sue Kim in civil court and take everything she has, but to be honest, Kim doesn't really have much waiting for her in Florida, so Cheryl's threat of civil court kind of falls flat here. As Kim returns to Florida as she gets on a bus from the airport, we get one of the most tragic scenes out of the whole show. From the perspective of anyone else on the bus, Kim just starts breaking down and bawling her eyes out seemingly out of nowhere. From our perspective, as someone who's followed Kim through her entire journey, it appears as if she's finally letting out emotions that have been bottled up for half a decade. It's an extremely powerful scene and it's purposely really hard to watch. The show just lingers on this shot of Kim crying and refuses to cut away from it, forcing us to uncomfortably watch as our hearts just sink. 
When first going into this episode, we assumed that the episode's title, Waterworks, was just in reference to Kim's job at Palm Coast Sprinklers, but now after watching it, we realize that it has a second meaning, being Kim's breakdown on the bus. I believe that Vince Gilligan, who wrote and directed this episode, stated on the Insider Podcast how this was one of, if not his favorite scene out of the entire episode, and I can see why. It's masterfully done, and it's honestly an Emmy-worthy performance out of Ray Seahorn, as it's a completely realistic, ugly cry. None of that fake, cliche beauty crying that Hollywood is known for. When people cry, it's ugly, and this scene perfectly captures that. So the entire first half of the episode focused on Kim and her life in Florida, while the second half of the episode focuses on Gene picking up from the cliffhanger at the end of the last episode of him breaking into the house of the cancer mark. I really like how this episode essentially shows us how Jimmy and Kim's phone call affected them each individually. It caused Kim to want to go finally turn herself in, and now we have the full context as to why Gene is relapsing back into the Saul Goodman slip and Jimmy personas in such a self-destructive and hateful way. So, as if breaking into the Cancer Mark's house wasn't already irrational and careless enough, once Gene is inside the house, he plays a key on the piano to test how asleep the Cancer Mark is, continuing his careless behavior. He gathers the information that he would need to pull off the identity theft con, and I find it pretty funny how after struggling to find the Mark's passwords, they turn out to be on a lamp that he was using to try and find them all along. Also, while Gene is taking photos of the Mark's sensitive information, the amount of money that he has in his investment report has multiple different meanings to them. He has $700 $137,612.62. The $737,000 is a reference to both of the amount of money that Walt said he needed to provide for his family during the Breaking Bad Season 2 premiere, along with $737 relating to the $737 down over Albuquerque reference of the planes crashing in the Breaking Bad Season 2 finale. Also, the $612 is a reference to this episode, Season 6, Episode 12, along with the $0.62 cents due to this episode being the 62nd episode of Better Call Saul. Now, after Gene grabs the information that he needs, Jeff arrives, giving Gene a chance to leave. However, instead of leaving when he has the opportunity to, he spitefully goes back for more, almost as if he wants to get caught. He goes upstairs to the Cancer Mark's man cave and starts grabbing himself a drink, opening the guy's cigar case, and even stealing some watches. When Gene first wanted to handle the Jeff problem, he was already risking a lot by getting involved with Jeff and Marion, but he set out to handle the situation and he did so successfully. It was only after his phone call with Kim that he ironically went back for more after telling Jeff not to himself. I guess he should have taken his own advice. Ever since Gene started relapsing due to his phone call with Kim, we've seen him become more and more careless. He started taking completely unnecessary risks, conning with Jeff and Buddy again even though he never needed the money. He tried doing it to distract himself from being alone with his own thoughts, along with trying to relive the glory days, but in both cases it hasn't worked. No matter how much Gene cons, robs, and schemes, he still feels an itch that he can't quite scratch, which may be why he goes back in for more instead of leaving the Cancer Mark's house. Also, due to now knowing the context of what was said between himself and Kim, it almost seems like Jimmy wants to get caught because he can't bring himself to actually outright turn himself in like Kim wants him to. Out of all the self-destructive behavior that we've seen Gene do throughout episodes 611 and 612, this is definitely the most blatant and obvious. I don't even think he's really doing it for the thrill of it, as he's purposely being sloppy and careless, almost as if to see how much he can truly get away with. Also, even though Gene did irrationally demand to be taken to the Cancer Mark's house and broke in, leaving proof that he was there that night, if he would've just left with the identity theft information as soon as Jeff arrived outside, he still could've potentially gone away with it. It's only going back in for more that caused the situation to truly hit the fan. Considering how Gene played a note on the piano to test if the man would wake up or not, Gene was already acting extremely careless before he even decided to go back for more instead of leaving when he had a chance, which may also be due to thinking that the man is incredibly knocked out from not waking up up from him playing the piano in the first place. Gene messing around in the Cancer Mark's man cave causes Gene to get stuck upstairs due to the Cancer Mark waking up to go to the bathroom and then trapping him by sitting on the stairs. This makes complete sense as Jeff even warned Gene that it's been hours since the man took the barbiturates, all Jeff not even knowing if he drank them all in the first place. Gene then prepares himself to brutally hit the man in the back of the head with an urn holding the ashes of his dead dog, but thankfully that doesn't end up happening as Gene realizes that the man fell asleep sitting on the stairs. So Gene manages to slip past him and get to the door, but hesitates leaving due to now seeing cops sitting behind Jeff's cab. Jeff notices this as well, causing him to speed off and crash his vehicle into a parked car, distracting the police long enough for Gene to get away. Do you think that Jeff simply crashed his cab due to being an idiot because he got spooked? Or do you think that Jeff purposely crashed as a distraction for the cops in order to allow Gene to get away? I personally like the latter option more because
because it makes the storytelling that much more brilliant if they created the scene to first just appear like Jeff got spooked and crashed because of it, but then the more you think about it, you actually realize that he did it on purpose in order to act as a distraction for Gene to get away. Let me know what you think in the comments because I will be returning to this topic more in depth in a future video. So we then cut back to the continuation of what we saw in the cold open, as Kim is now in Saul's office signing their divorce papers. This is the only time that we see Kim in Saul's office as it's seemingly her first and last time. I'm unsure of exactly how much time has passed between her breaking up with Jimmy and now, but it's clear that they haven't seen each other in at least a few months, along with this being the last time that they'll see each other for the foreseeable future. It feels like Kim is wanting to speak to Saul, but Saul is spitefully pretending to ignore Kim while going on his phone as if he doesn't care that she's sitting right in front of him. This is the last time that they see each other or speak for years, so it's depressing how petty Saul is towards the situation just because she broke up with him. They eventually do make small talk, but Jimmy belittles Kim by first asking her why she's moving to Florida just to tell her that it doesn't matter. Jimmy then rubs in her face the fact that she didn't accept any of the Sandpiper money, either oblivious as to the reason why or just mad that she can't bear to take any of it. As I mentioned during 609, Kim wants nothing to do with conning or anything that came of it as she wants to leave it all behind her. She doesn't feel like she deserves the money after what happened to Howard and feels too guilty taking it. The way that Saul and Kim react from what happened with Howard and Lalo are truly the two extreme sides of the scale. Kim wants nothing and runs away from her conning life, whereas Saul fully embraces it by taking all the money and turning his entire life into becoming a crooked con man lawyer. So as they're talking, Saul also brings up the new look of his office, as it's the Cathedral of Justice that Kim once said Saul should have back in 601. Kim, now clearly removed from her conning days and with a completely different mindset, is unwilling to appreciate him making her previous vision of his office a reality. Plus, she's also probably just taken back by how much Saul's embracing it to the point that she feels like she doesn't even know him anymore, which is why she says what she says to Jesse a few moments from now. Saul telling her to have a nice life has got to be the most cliche petty thing you could say, especially since he just goes back to ignoring her, waiting for her to leave. You can tell that Saul's being petty like this on purpose just to hurt her, as even he can probably tell that she wishes that they could just have a rational conversation. Also, considering how social Saul usually is, it speaks volumes just seeing how much she's trying to actively avoid speaking to her. I like how when Kim stands up to leave, the camera doesn't move, purposely leaving her head out of frame to show the total disconnect between them. As Kim leaves, Saul purposely sexualizes Francesca as a way to perceive himself as being jaded to not having Kim in his life anymore and I wonder if the creators added this in to try and negate the way that Saul does the same thing multiple times during Breaking Bad, since Saul commenting about Francesca's ass in Breaking Bad 208 is apparently one of the creators' biggest regrets once they started creating Better Call Saul. So as Kim walks out of the office, the next client to go see Saul is Emilio, which is great foreshadowing for the Jesse cameo that we're about to see. Now of all the Walt and Jesse Better Call Saul theories that we've considered throughout the years, seeing Jesse through Emilio has always been a popular choice. This is because we knew that Saul helped out Emilio multiple times in the past, which is why Jesse even thought highly of Saul in the first place when he convinced Walter to hire him for Badger. Now we know that seeing Emilio during this episode is the first time that Saul represented him, with the second time being during the first episode of Breaking Bad. Now since I kept pushing for the Emilio-Jesse cameo connection so much while theorizing how we could potentially see Walt and or Jesse in Better Call Saul, I'm happy that this theory was correct and actually came true. Speaking of which, as Kim goes outside to have a cigarette, we see Jesse already standing out there. I like how the camera pans to show that Jesse was originally hidden behind the pillar, it reminds me a lot of a similar scene during the ending of Breaking Bad when Walt is revealed to be in the same room as Skylar the final time that he speaks to her. This is also one of the only times that we actually see it rain throughout both Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. I really like how they chose to have it rain during this scene, as it does add to the tone of this being the last real time that Kim spoke to Saul, with Jesse even commenting on how crazy it is to see how hard it's pouring. So Jesse actually recognizes Kim as a lawyer due to the fact that she once represented his friend Combo, which is based off of a throwaway line from Breaking Bad when Hank was talking about Combo after his death. It's just crazy how well the creators of the show can turn such forgettable throwaway lines from Breaking Bad into something more significant. It just gives Breaking Bad that much more rewatchability and enjoyment while doing so. Jesse seems to think Loli is Saul at this point in time due to not yet seeing the magic man that he can be, so it's interesting to think how much his opinion of Saul changes by the time Breaking Bad happens due to Saul helping Emilio avoid criminal charges multiple times. Due to this, it's interesting hearing Jesse low-key trash talk Saul as not being a real lawyer, especially since Saul has now embraced the idea of people thinking of him that 
that way when it originally really bothered him back when the Kettlemans and Chuck told him that during the 2004 era. I also like how when Jesse compliments Kim for helping out Combo, he says how she got him off scot-free, which is the same thing that he'll eventually say in Breaking Bad about Saul helping out Emilio. Also, the fact that Emilio insisted on going to Saul for illegal representation due to his commercials really shows how Saul's advertising definitely works for the clientele demographic that it's intended for. I love Kim's response to Jesse asking if Saul's a good lawyer. It's just a perfect representation of how she feels like she doesn't even know Jimmy anymore due to his full-on Saul Goodman persona feeling unrecognizable. Kim and Jesse are truly two passing ships in the night in regard to the criminal underworld surrounding Saul. Kim is on her way out while Jesse's on his way in. This also marks the second and final Jesse cameo for the show, and I really liked it, even if it was a bit fan y It was really interesting seeing Kim meet Jesse, even if they are just strangers and don't realize the significant roles that they both play in the Breaking Bad universe. But back in the Gene timeline, we see Gene retrieve his car from across the street from Marion's and goes back home waiting for a phone call from Jeff in jail. Gene even accurately predicts when Jeff will call while doing his jazz hands as a callback to the first episode of the show when Jimmy got back to his nail salon office hoping for calls from potential clients. So when Jeff calls Gene over the phone, he calls Gene dad as a cover, which is incredibly ironic considering what Gene said in 610 about Jeff not having to call him dad yet. I suppose that the time has come, but not for the reason that we originally thought. Jeff tells Gene that the cops think that he committed the robbery because the cancer mark stumbled out of his house and flagged down those cops once he realized that he was just robbed. Gene tells Jeff that since there's no evidence pinning him on the robbery, he should be fine, and so he calls Marion to inform her of the bad news. Gene tells her that he'll help get Jeff out of jail, but due to being blind to seeing her as a potential threat, he talks too loosely, letting it slip that he knows about the laws from Albuquerque when he had previously told her that he had never been there. Marion gets a gut feeling that something is wrong, causing her to put two and two together due to multiple reasons. There's the suspicious activity that she saw from Gene previously interacting with Jeff the night before, the fact that Jeff called Gene while in jail first instead of her, along with Gene wanting Marion to go pay Jeff's bail instead of him, implying that he doesn't want to speak to the police. So while Gene is on his way, she does her own research on the computer that Jeff bought her. Apparently, she uses Ash Jeeves to look up Albuquerque con man and Saul Goodman popped right up, confirming her suspicions. It's also funny how Gene is joyfully singing along with the radio while on his way to Marion's when she's literally uncovering his past. It perfectly shows how oblivious he is about the situation he's about to walk into when he gets to her house, which he only has himself to blame for. Although Bob Odenkirk's singing is iconically tone deaf, I still love hearing it, especially in the scene due to him starting the chorus at the wrong time, which was apparently even more improv by Mr. Odenkirk himself. So by the time Gene arrives at Marion's house to pick her up to go help Jeff, he notices Marion distracted on her laptop. She tries hiding what she was looking at, but Gene easily recognizes the sound of his old commercial, so he grabs the laptop and discovers that she's been watching his most iconic commercial from Breaking Bad. As Gene looks at the laptop screen, we see the reflection of his old commercial in his glasses, and it's in color too, paralleling the exact same thing happening back in the season 1 Gene scene. These are the only two times that we ever really see color during the Gene timeline, not potentially counting the cigarette for the next episode, but it's symbolism for the entire reason as to why the Gene timeline is in black and white in the first place. Since Saul hates his life as Gene due to being forced to live in isolation, he's essentially a shell of his former self, with the color literally sucked out of his life. This is why the only time that we see color in the Gene timeline is from his old commercials, as it was the glory days in his eyes. During the season 1 Gene scene, you had to really be looking for it to notice it, but here in 612, it's a lot more obvious. So Gene initially tries pleading ignorance, but Marion is way too smart to fall for something like that. Marion feels defeated as she realizes that her new friend Jean has actually been conning her all along, showing by her realizing that Jean's fake dog Nippy never actually existed. As Marion goes to call the police, Jean rips the cord out of her hands and out of the wall, and starts wrapping it around his own hands in a way that makes it seem like he's about to strangle her to keep his identity a secret. The way that he menacingly approaches her while doing so really makes it seem like he's going to, and I think he actually would have if it weren't for her using her potential final moments to tell Gene that she trusted him. This snaps Gene out of his murderous tendencies for just long enough that he backs down and gives her back her life alert, allowing her to press the button and ask for help outing Gene. Realizing that he has to flee, the episode ends with Gene rushing out the back door, which is an amazing penultimate cliffhanger leading us into the series finale. This probably comes as no surprise, but this episode also gets a double S tier. It's amazing for so many ways, I just love it so much. 
First off, seeing everything in regard to Kim in Florida was an incredible payoff for the series-long mystery of wondering where Kim was throughout Breaking Bad and into the Gene timeline, if she even was still alive. But then showing how Gene was his own downfall fits perfectly with the character, leading up to the incredibly nerve-wracking Marion confrontation at the end. This episode flowed so well and is, in my opinion, the perfect penultimate episode for the show along with the Gene timeline. It's kind of funny how we technically got two penultimate episodes, first with 607 for the 2004 era and now 612 for the 20. 10 era. Now in regard to the way that this episode ended, as if killing an innocent old sweet woman in her home wasn't already bad enough, having her hypothetical final words being to tell her would-be killer that she trusted him breaks Gene and snaps him back to reality, showing that there is some sort of humanity left in him. I feel like if Gene would have actually killed Marion, it would have made him an irredeemable character, but since he backs down, there's still a little bit of leeway there. I think that Marion being the one to discover Gene's true identity is a great way to conclude her character. It all started with Gene using Marion to just get to Jeff to neutralize him as a threat, when in reality, Marion ended up being the true threat. This just goes to show that sometimes the people that end up catching you are the people that you least expect. Jean played things too loose around Marion because he didn't see her as a threat, when in reality, she's the one that ends up realizing who he really is. It's also ironic how Jean wasn't concerned that Jeff brought Marion a laptop at all in the previous episode, when the laptop is how Marion was able to quickly find out what Jean's true identity was. It's crazy to think that if Jean would have just listened to Jeff and Buddy about letting the cancer mark go, this entire domino effect that's led to Marion realizing Jean's true identity would have never happened, which makes me kind of laugh whenever I see the scene in 611 of Jean telling Jeff that everything will be fine. Jean continuing to be more and more careless has gone himself made, which further shows how he is his own greatest enemy and that he simply cannot stop getting in the way of himself. Now, on to the series finale of Better Call Saul. <laughs> The series finale of Better Call Saul. Season 6, Episode 13, Saul Gone. The finale opens with an unexpected but fitting flashback to Better Call Saul 508 Bagman, and shows Jimmy and Mike out in the desert after the events of the episode but before they get back into town. I say this is fitting simply due to the fact that Bagman was the most iconic episode of Better Call Saul at the time of its airing, all of it being the most difficult episode to film, so it makes sense that they'd pay respects to it in the series finale. I love the establishing shots of the desert as we get multiple hints to clue us in and take us back to when this episode happened. There's Jimmy Suzuki's steam in the ditch, the space blanket that Jimmy used to lure out the final hitman, and money stuck in a cactus from when Jimmy stubbed his toe, creating his rock bottom moment. So Jimmy and Mike come across a sister in a wall showing how they were able to hydrate themselves during their trek back home. It's funny how Jimmy is so excited that he just dunks his head in, to the point that Mike has to tell him to slow down or he's gonna be sick after being dehydrated for so long. It's also funny how Jimmy dumps out the piss from his water bottle and instantly fills it up with actual water before Mike even has a chance to drink any, implying that Jimmy has now contaminated the water with his piss bottle. I'm probably overthinking it, but I can't help but mention that every time I watch this scene. So as they sit down and rest by the cistern, Jimmy suggests taking Lalo's bit money, which may be a reference to the final scene during the season 1 finale where Jimmy told Mike that if he ever had a large sum of money in front of him again, he'd take it instead of doing the right thing. Mike responds realistically by saying how it's not theirs and that he can think of a few people who wouldn't be okay with it disappearing, Lalo and the Salamancas, along with Gus as well. Mike wonders if Jimmy's even thinking right, as taking the money for themselves sounds like crazy talk, leading Jimmy to introduce the hypothetical of them building a time machine with it in order to escape anyone looking to come after them for the money. Money. Jimmy asks Mike what he'd do if he could go back in time, which Mike turns into a question about regret, thinking of what he'd go back and change if he could. Mike brings up the date that his son Maddie was killed, implying that he'd go back to stop the murder. However, after thinking about it for a moment longer, Mike states how he'd go back to the day that he took his first bribe as a cop, since that's what started an incredibly long domino effect that would eventually result in his son's death, once again acknowledging how Mike feels completely to blame for his son dying. Mike then says how he'd go ahead a few years to check up on his family and see how they're doing, implying that he wants to see how well off his family is after his death in order to see if providing for them as much as he has been actually worked out in the end. Mike then asks Jimmy what he'd do but is disappointed when Jimmy gives an artificial answer stating how he'd go back in time to make himself rich. This is one of the only sentimental and down-to-earth moments that Mike is ever willing to share with Jimmy, but Jimmy can't bring himself to open up to Mike the same way that Mike has to him. This just shows how closed off Jimmy is with 
his true emotions, as he has compartmentalized anything tragic that's ever happened to him, such as anything involving Chuck. In order to cut the conversation short, Jimmy states how he's well rested enough so they get up and continue on with their journey back home. This marks Mike's final scene in the show and I really enjoy it. Mike's also the first of three big character cameos that will get to see their own flashbacks in this episode as they all relate to the idea of regret that Mike just discussed with Jimmy. We'll get to those as they come up, but in the meantime, it's back to the Gene timeline as we pick up right where the last episode left off. As Gene rushes out of Marion's and into his car, Marion gives a vague description of his car to her life alert nurse, along with managing to read off his license plate before he can drive away. So Gene manages to make it back home before the cops arrive, but as he's gathering his things, he overhears himself being reported through the police radio. Gene realizes that there are cops outside approaching his house, so he manages to gather a shoebox and a burner phone, with him revealed to have a cabinet completely full of them. Gene manages to slip out his back window and goes on the run. As Gene runs into a water tunnel, or a culvert if you will, he gets spooked to run to cover due to hearing a police helicopter above. It seems like Gene was able to get to cover before the heli flew above him, but I'm still unsure if he wasn't seen at all. Gene manages to slip through a fence into a back alley, but realizes that he's cornered as there's cops swarming all around him. After he notices cops around one corner from the end of the alley, he goes to the opposite end, but when cops suddenly stop there too, he quickly manages to dumpster dive in order to just barely hide from them before they can see him. While in the dumpster, Gene opens his shoebox and band-aid box to retrieve Ed the Disappear's phone number as he intends on using the burner phone to call him to relocate. However, as Gene struggles to open the plastic package that the burner phone is in, he accidentally knocks over his shoebox, causing his diamonds to spill everywhere due to foolishly keeping the band-aid box open as well. Gene freaks out and starts trying to retrieve them, but gets interrupted by the police banging on the dumpster implying that they have him cornered. Gene, realizing he's caught, slowly stands up in the dumpster and is arrested. It's absolutely wild how Gene gets caught only several minutes into the episode, as it's an excellent subversion of expectations. We all thought that most of the episode would focus on Gene on the run, with us not expecting to get the answer of if Gene gets caught or not until much later in the episode. Since it happened so soon, it gave us all a what the heck, what now feeling as it just works so well. There are a few more things I'd like to touch on before we move on from this dumpster scene. First, Gene hiding in the dumpster may be a reference to when he went dumpster diving in 108 to try and find the Sandpiper shredded documents. Fun fact, they actually used the same dumpster in this episode that they used in 108. Also, Gene getting caught in the dumpster may have been foreshadowed way back in 601 during the cold open due to us watching the Saul Goodman cutout get placed in the dumpster. It's incredibly shocking how after two years of theorizing about Gene's diamonds ever since they were revealed to us during the season 5 Gene scene, they just end up being forgotten about at the bottom of a dumpster. Again, great subversion of expectations. Plus, it's depressing to consider that Gene's shoebox was also left in the dumpster as well, as it was a collection of memories from his previous life. And then finally, I like how the show implies to us exactly how Gene was caught as he stands up in the dumpster due to the show including a security camera in the shot, implying how one of the stores connected to this back alley has a camera on their back door that actually caught Gene going to hide in the dumpster. We then cut to Gene at the Omaha police station, and to be honest, I'm surprised they didn't somehow run into Jeff considering how Jeff is most likely still around there somewhere. As Gene sits there and waits, he can overhear the police watching his most famous Saul Goodman commercial, the same one that we heard Marion watching last episode, which is the first ever Saul commercial that we saw in Breaking Bad during Breaking Bad 208. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do, and so do I. So Gene gets his obligatory phone call, and he uses it to call Cinnabon to inform them that they're gonna need a new manager. It's incredibly interesting and kinda tragic that Gene uses his one free phone call to call his workplace and inform them of his absence, as he has no one else useful to call. He doesn't have any friends, family, or associates that could help him in this situation. Gene calling Cinnabon also reminds me of Gus calling Lyle in 609, as both of their minds for some reason instantly went to wanting to give their respective workplaces a courtesy call. Afterwards, as Gene sits in a cell, he starts pacing around shaming himself for getting caught in such a foolish way, especially after everything he went through to go into hiding. Seems like he's now having a moment of clarity, realizing how careless and self-destructive he's truly been lately. 
Gene goes to take his anger out on the door, but the door clearly wins with Gene shriveling up in pain on the floor after punching it. Gene notices a carving on the wall stating, my lawyer will ream your ass, and in this moment, everything clicks for Gene, as he gives off an eerie laugh that's gotta be a reference to Walt at the end of Crawl Space. This is where we start seeing the true transformation of Gene reverting back into Saul Goodman for good, as he realizes that working the system has always been what he's best at. So Saul bangs on the door to request one more phone call, which he uses to call Bill Oakley due to Francesca previously telling him that Oakley's now a defense attorney. I love Oakley's reaction as he drops one of his envelopes while in denial that he's actually hearing Saul's voice. Saul clears up his situation to Oakley and that he's been arrested, and wants Oakley to act as his advisory counsel. This is what I was hinting at earlier in the season when I mentioned that we'd see a lot more of Oakley before the show was over, and I could not be happier. So although Oakley is reluctant to take this case, Saul manages to convince him to, even though Oakley thinks that Saul is screwed regardless of who's on his side due to the mountain of evidence that the police most likely have against him. We then cut to Saul being brought into a negotiation room to work out a plea deal, but as he's being transported down the hallway, he notices Marie Schrader standing on the other side of the bars. Out of all the Breaking Bad cameos I expected to see in the finale, Marie was definitely not one of them, or at least lower down on the list. So as Saul gets read out his multiple life sentences worth of charges, he zones out, looking at the obvious two-way mirror, thinking about how Marie is definitely behind it. Saul gets told that he has life plus 190 years stacked against him, but that they're willing to offer him a one-time plea deal of 30 years, giving him the possibility of being a free man by the time he's an old man. Saul redirects the conversation by requesting to have Marie enter the room to speak to him, and even though Oakley mentions how inappropriate it would be to have her appear at the plea meeting, since both sides agree, she enters the room. Here we get a great monologue from Marie describing Hank in the positive light that she remembers him as in order to guilt Saul due to aiding Walt, the man who got both Hank and Gomi killed. Although Hank isn't a perfect man and has flaws like any human being, it makes sense that Marie would put him up on a pedestal the way that she does, being his widow and all. Marie also brings up Gomez and how his death has caused his wife to be left with three fatherless children. Saul gives Marie his condolences, stating that he met Hank multiple times in the past, painting Hank in a good light as well. Saul acknowledges that both Hank and Marie are victims, but then he calls himself a victim too. Saul then describes the events that transpired in Breaking Bad 2 Away during Saul's introduction to Walt and Jesse, including them kidnapping him and bringing him out into the desert at gunpoint after he wouldn't accept their bribe, once again putting an emphasis on the iconic it wasn't me it was Ignacio scene. The way that the creators linked all of this together is absolutely brilliant, as it gives yet another reason as to why the creators refreshed our memories about that scene during 611. Saul explains how he only worked with Walt due to being in fear the entire time, but Marie and the rest of the prosecution clearly isn't falling for his sob story. Even so, Saul continues his sob story by bringing up Walt's plan to kill all of Mike's men in prison within the time span of two minutes, continuing Saul's reasoning as to why he was so afraid of Walt, as he implies that if he went to prison for ratting out Walt, that Walt would have had him killed. Saul also states that although Walt is dead, his affiliates, including Jesse, are still out there, causing Saul to be unable to have peace of mind. Saul then tells Marie that he's lost everything from his family, his career, and even his freedom, which reminds me a lot of what Gene said to Frank during his fake mental breakdown in 610. The prosecution calls Saul out for foolishly thinking that the jury will buy his sob story, but Saul contradicts him by stating how he only needs one to believe him, implying how the possibility of that happening is enough to get the prosecutor worried. Saul then turns the odds in his favor by playing on the idea that the lead prosecutor has never lost a case. Although Saul's case seems open and shut, he's able to use the lead prosecutor's perfect record as a way to psych him out into worrying that he could lose his perfect streak. This is a brilliant way of Saul being able to detect the lead prosecutor's one weakness and expose it in order to work out a more cushiony plea deal to assure the prosecutor that he wins. Saul stating that he hopes that there's some wiggle room to work with has got to be a reference to him saying the same thing when negotiating the price of Jesse's house in Breaking Bad 302. So Marie puts her foot down and angrily tells the prosecutor to not make a deal, then we cut to Marie angrily stomping out of the negotiation room, implying that the prosecutor didn't listen to her. This reminds me a lot of when Marie demanded Hank to stay put at his house and to not go see Hector near the end of season 4 when Hank was under protection, but Hank went against Marie's wishes and went and saw Hector down at the station anyways. You're not going to negotiate with this man. You're not. a ridiculous idea, and there is no way that you are going to do it. End of story. 
Hank, thanks for coming down. So we then cut back to the plea negotiation after it's been going on for hours, with the end game resulting in Saul's plea deal being cut down from 30 years to a measly seven and a half. Even though Saul already has just about the best plea deal that anyone in his situation could ever ask for, he pushes the envelope by wanting to add on the clause of him being able to serve out his time in a cushiony federal prison as he states how he's seen how bad they can get due to once visiting a client at a horrible one in the past. As if that wasn't enough, Saul really tries seeing how far he can go without crossing the line by requesting to get a pint of mint chocolate chip ice cream every Friday as icing on the cake. This is also in reference to the fact that mint chocolate chip ice cream used to be his favorite until he got involved with Wallow. At the end of 502, mint chocolate chip was the kind of ice cream cone that he was forced to drop on the side of the road when being picked up by Nacho to meet Lalo, which as we all know, was sworn by ants by the time Nacho dropped Saul off in the exact same spot in 503. Then in 510, when Kim was grabbing ice cream for them from their ice cream bar at the hotel, Jimmy told Kim to not give him mint chip ice cream, implying how the events of 502 to 503 ruined the flavor for him. But now, around six years later, Saul is requesting that very same flavor ice cream. Is it because he's gotten over his distaste of it, showing how he's able to move past the trauma that Lalo brought him, or is it a sentimental way for Saul to remind himself of those events, similar to how he kept memorabilia of his past lives in his shoebox? Anyways, in order to try and solidify his request for the ice cream, he brings up how he has more information to give them, implying Howard's murder, but the prosecution just laughs at him as they're already well aware of it due to Kim having previously told the Albuquerque DA office all about it. This comes as a shock to Saul, which completely changes his outlook on the entire situation. Saul must be realizing that his phone call with Kim actually motivated her to turn herself in like he said, even though he didn't really mean it. This caused him to realize how guilty Kim truly feels over everything that's happened, something that he was previously blind to. We do need to put a pin in how Saul reacts to this though, as we instead get a flashback to Saul and Walt in Ed the Disappear's basement while they both wait to be relocated. This of course happens during Granite State, which I was incredibly hyped to see, as one of my many Walt and Jesse Better Call Saul cameo theories was also to get a missing scene of Walt and Saul in Ed's basement together. So Saul is woken up by Walt messing around with the water heater since he has experience with them due to the old broken down one that plagued his old house for years until he finally replaced it in season 2. While being obsessed over it may also be a reference to how he was obsessed over a minute details such as the fly and the super lab. While being obsessed over the water heater is a clear sign of Walt distracting himself and trying to keep his mind busy in order to ignore the more important situation at hand, similar to when he replaced the water heater and created the crawl space due to wood rot in Breaking Bad season 2. So Saul tries to lay back down to rest, but the loud noises from Walt messing around with the water heater keeps him up, so he asks Walt of the time machine question being an obvious callback to his conversation with Mike out in the desert. Walt hilariously condescends Saul like a total jackass, calling him out for how impossible time travel truly is, telling him to stay in your lane, along stating how Saul is actually asking about regrets. This is such a Walt way to react, and really brings you back to many classic scenes throughout Breaking Bad. Walt is clearly easily working up here and on edge due to the situation that he's in, which may be why he's distracting himself with the water heater repairs in the first place. Saul is blatantly aware of this, shown by the Granite State scene when Saul looked at Walt having a temper tantrum in Ed's security camera when Saul first arrived. This is why Saul was hesitant, asking Walt what he's even doing, as Walt clearly appears to be taking jabs at Saul any chance he can get. Saul finally admits that he's asking about regrets, and as Walt thinks about his, he looks down at the watch that Jesse gave him during his 51st birthday. This is most likely symbolism for Walt regretting that he outed Jesse to Jack's crew after everything that they had been through, also foreshadowing how Walt will eventually save Jesse and Felina. Now, Walt has many regrets that he could pull from during the events that transpired throughout Breaking Bad, but instead of bringing up Jesse, Hank, or even Skyler and Walt Jr., he selfishly brings up his regret to leave Grey Matter, as Walt's ego and pride is one of the core problems of his character. Due to this, instead of admitting that he regrets holding his pride so highly or admitting the truth of how leaving Grey Matter was his own fault, he still skews the story in such a way that makes it seem like he was shafted from the company, as he still feels like he deserves the millions that Gretchen and Elliot made off of his work. Yet again, this foreshadows the events that have yet to happen, with Walt seeing Gretchen and Elliot talking about him on TV being what motivated him to return to Albuquerque at the end of Granite State instead of turning himself in as he initially intended. So Walt explains how he thought that he was doing the 
gentlemanly thing by stepping away from Gretchen and Elliot, and then accusing them of tactically planning to remove him from the situation so they could steal his work and become rich off of it. That being said, if you know the real story behind Walt and Gretchen, you know how Walt's opinion of what happened is far from the truth, as this is really only slanted copium that Walt tries telling himself. I do plan on discussing Grey Matter and why Walt truly left the company and broke up with Gretchen in the future, but for now I'll just say that Walt tends to blame them for his own actions due to being unable to cope with the fact that leaving them in the rearview mirror as his pride and ego got the best of him is definitely one of the biggest mistakes that he ever made during the first 50 years of his life, with that being something that he has had years and years to compartmentalize. Saul gets excited over this revelation, stating how if Walt would have told him about Grey Matter, they could have done something about it, but is instantly let down by Walt stating how Saul would have been the last lawyer that he would have gone to about it. Walt then asks Saul if he has any regrets, but Saul takes so long to answer that Walt implies to forget about it. Again, just like with the Mike flashback, Saul's again unable to give a genuine answer about any regrets that he may have, which makes me question why Saul even brought up the topic to Walt if he can't even answer it honestly himself. Saul's artificial answer this time is explaining how he regrets a certain slip and fall con that he did back in Cicero during his slip and Jimmy days, explaining why he has bad knees, which is a recurring theme during Breaking Bad, especially being first introduced during the It Wasn't Me It Was Ignacio scene out in the desert, as Saul's bad knees was his excuse to stand up away from the open grave and face Walt and Jesse on an equal level while speaking to them. The scene ends with Walt standing up to tell Saul that he's always been like this, and as he says this, you can see the smile instantly drain from Saul's face with what Walt says to him possibly making him think about the way that Chuck always saw him as Slip and Jimmy who'd never change. We then cut back to Saul on an airplane being extradited back to Albuquerque, but not just any plane as it's revealed that he's on a Wayfair plane, obviously being the same airline that had the tragic mid-flight collision during the Breaking Bad season 2 finale. Apparently they were originally going to show the airplane flying over the desert where Jimmy Suzuki esteems still sits ever since Bagman, but they cut that due to time, which is why we never saw the shot of the final 613 teaser trailer in the actual episode. Anyway, Saul convinces the air marshal to allow him to speak to Oakley due to the fact that anything said between between them in front of the air marshal isn't privileged, meaning that the air marshal can pass on anything that they say to the prosecution. I love the way the creators wrote this scene to make that exposition as natural as possible, since the exposition is given as the reason that Saul convinces the air marshal to let him speak to Oakley in the first place. Ever since the end of the plea negotiation, Saul has clearly been thinking about how Kim tried turning herself in, causing Saul to ask Oakley about her. Oakley informs Saul the same thing that we learned in the last episode through Kim speaking to Cheryl, which is that since there's no witnesses or evidence backing up Kim's confession that the DA will likely just sit on it for now, although apparently Cheryl wants to still sue Kim in civil court over it. Saul gives himself a moment to think about the situation while Oakley goes to the bathroom, then on Oakley's way back, Saul stops him again to tell him that he has more information about the Howard situation to give up that no one is aware of. Oakley warns Saul that if he gives up more information about Howard, it'll screw over Kim even more, but Saul just gives the excuse that he's only doing it in order to get the ice cream that he requested, when in reality it's to assure that Kim will be there when Saul goes into his hearing. Speaking of Kim, we then cut back to her at Palm Coast Sprinklers having lunch with her coworkers, as she's still unable to give any direct response when asked about her opinion about mundane topics. This shows that although Kim tried to turn herself in, she still feels the same due to the fact that she was able to return to her life in Florida as nothing has come of her confession. This clearly bothers Kim as she leaves work early to go volunteer at a local legal aid. It appears that Kim's urge to help people who are in need is starting to act up again, as that's why she was so passionate with pro bono cases in the first place. Although Kim doesn't have her law license back, she volunteers at this legal aid in order to help out in a way that's still possible for her. Kim stays until well into the evening after it gets dark out, but gets interrupted by a courtesy call from Suzanne Erickson. She informs Kim of Saul's current situation, along with how Saul is planning on giving a testimony that affects her. This is all according to Saul's plan as his entire goal, bluffing about having more information about Howard, is solely to get Kim down to that courtroom for his hearing. We then cut to Saul with a smug look on his face as he's walked into the courtroom, and his outfit really says it all as far as him reverting back to his Saul Goodman persona. He has a flashy silver suit, and he's even wearing the Wayfair ribbon that was a staple of his Breaking Bad outfit during seasons 3 and onward, which he may have only been reminded of due to flying on a Wayfair plane back to Albuquerque. As he enters the courtroom, he notices that Kim is there, signifying to him that his plan to trick her into coming has worked. We also see how Marie is there alongside Gomi's widow, which is a nice touch, though it would have been nice to see Skylar there alongside them, but it's whatever considering she wouldn't have had any speaking lines during this scene either. 
As Saul gets the cuffs taken off of him and looks back towards Kim while he gets seated, I love the detail of Kim tapping her heel as it's been a staple characteristic of her since she was a child, with this symbolizing her anxiousness towards the whole situation. You also gotta love the It's Showtime line that Saul quietly mutters to himself as well, which is the continuation of a reference to Season 1 that I mentioned in 610 during the clothing store heist with Jeff. As the judge initiates the hearing, we hear her say it's the United States versus Saul Goodman, which is just such an epic introduction to this climactic courtroom scene. The judge questions why the prosecution is giving Saul such a cushiony plea deal considering all the charges held against him, and while the prosecution explains themselves, Oakley writes Saul a note stating how the judge always follows sentencing recommendations, implying that although it doesn't initially sound good, Saul has nothing to worry about. Saul then stands up, interrupting the prosecution, stating how he wants to clear the air. The fact that he doubles down on wanting to speak after the judge warns him that anything he says could jeopardize his cushioning recommendation starts to show how Saul is having a change of heart as we'll soon see. Saul starts giving the same sob story that he had previously told Marine, the lead prosecutor, during his plea negotiations, causing them to roll their eyes, implying, here we go. This was, of course, Saul's original plan that caused the prosecution to worry about him potentially convincing at least one juror against them, which is why the prosecution even agreed to give Saul such a cushiony plea deal in the first place. So Saul going up to the stand and starting to say this sob story anyways is technically him betraying the plea deal that the prosecution agreed to, that is, until he switches up his speech. Saul subverts their expectations as well as the viewing audience by going off script and completely changing his outlook on the situation. Saul goes from what would have initially been him painting a picture of himself as a victim to a culprit responsible for aiding in Walt's empire. Saul starts by stating what we saw during the 611 missing scenes, which was the fact that Saul saw an opportunity in Walt and purposely sought after him to create a partnership in order to make them both rich validating how Marie accused him of aiding Walt for money earlier in the episode during the plea negotiation. The judge tries getting Saul to stop and reconsider what he's saying, as he's about to completely ruin his plea deal, but Saul doubles down on contradicting the plea agreement as he says that the court deserves to know the whole truth, when in reality, the only person that he really wants to hear the truth is Kim. Saul seems to think that outing himself in court is the only way for Kim to believe that his confession means something, as he's essentially throwing himself under the bus to turn himself in, which is what Kim told him to do during their phone call. Saul is truly doing everything that he can to redeem himself in Kim's eyes, as she's the one person still alive that he truly cares about. So if ruining his plea deal and getting life in prison is the cost, he still finds it worth it as Kim's perspective of him is still that important to him after all these years. In the middle of all this courtroom drama, the creator still somehow managed to squeeze in a tad of comedy, as Oakley requests to be removed from the case after both him and the prosecutor stand up in argument of whether or not Saul should continue speaking. Saul then gets sworn in under oath and denies being under the influence of drugs of any kind. Saul admits how he lied to the government about having information in regard to Howard's death, openly admitting how he only did that in order to trick him into appearing as he wanted her to hear all of his confessions. Saul elaborates how although he wasn't around for the drugs being cooked or sold or witnessed any of the murders that had happened throughout Breaking Bad, he was fully aware of what was going on and aided in while doing so, even bragging about making millions as a result of it and once again validating Marie. Saul states how Walt would have been dead or behind bars within a month if he had never walked into Saul's office, which is also a direct reference to the 611 missing scene of Mike essentially telling Saul the same thing as Mike's reasoning to tell Saul to stay away from Walt, which Saul knowingly went against. Well, if the cancer doesn't get him, it'll be the cops or a bullet to the head. If he hadn't walked into my office that day, Walter White would have been dead or behind bars within a month. Saul even going as far as to state that Walt would have never gone to where he was without his help, which has become quite the iconic line. Fact is, Walter White couldn't have done it without me. As Saul finishes, he looks back to see if he's gained Kim's approval, but her expression to him implies that she's waiting to hear something that he hasn't mentioned yet. Although Saul admitting to everything that happened throughout Breaking Bad is all fine and dandy, it has nothing to do with Kim, as the thing that's really hung her up was everything involving Howard. Also, as far as the conclusion for the show goes, it's nice getting all these Breaking Bad confessions considering this is acting as a Breaking Bad sequel in a way, but all things considered, this is the Better Call Saul finale, not the Breaking Bad finale, so it only makes sense that Saul would confess to what's happened throughout the events of Better Call Saul as well. Once again, Oakley tries defending Saul by having his testimony stricken from the record while the prosecution argues to let Saul continue speaking, and since Saul practically begs to continue, the judge allows it. Saul stays vague in regard to Howard, but implies 
that Kim's confession statement is true and that she left town because of it. Saul calls her courageous for doing so, however, as he's the one that truly ran away. I think it's interesting how Saul calls Kim courageous for being able to start a new life though, due to not knowing how Kim actually put herself in her own self-created hell as punishment for what happened to Howard. Saul then brings up Chuck, admits to messing with his insurance, causing Chuck to lose his job which resulted in him taking his own life. I love this moment so much that I created an elaborate breakdown of it titled Saul Goodman's Worst Regret, which I'll of course have linked to the description along with the long list of side videos that I've been mentioning. That being said, I'll give a short version here, which is that it's so satisfying to finally hear Saul come clean about messing with Chuck's insurance due to it being his darkest secret that he's kept to himself for the longest time. Both Chuck and Howard died never knowing the truth, and we always wondered if Jimmy would take it to his grave, so it's a great payoff seeing him publicly admit to it in court. I also of course like the reference to the end of the three of chicanery episode in this scene since we see the courtroom exit sign above Saul as he speaks about Chuck. Some may think it's a bit on the nose, but I think it's a great payoff reference to the fans that just really take the time to notice and analyze each and every detail that the show has to offer. Out of everything that Jimmy just confessed to, as far as his character development goes, this is probably the most important. For years, Jimmy has been compartmentalizing Chuck's death, from allowing Howard to take the blame when he knew it was really his fault, to not reacting whatsoever, or talking to a therapist about it when that's all that Kim ever wanted from him throughout all of season 4, to not understanding why not mentioning Chuck was why he wasn't initially reinstated as a lawyer, and many other examples too. From all the times that Jimmy pretended like Chuck's death didn't matter, this scene shows the audience and Kim how Jimmy truly feels about it as he knows deep down that he has to live with the fact that he unintentionally caused his brother's death, which was a lesson that he was never willing to learn or admit to. It's in this moment that Saul reverts back to Jimmy McGill, but becomes a new version of himself as he tells the judge that his full name is James McGill. The name's McGill. I'm James McGill. This implies that although he's reverted from Gene to Saul and now back to Jimmy, he's coming out of the other end as a new version of himself, James. So James is able to own up to his actions and hold himself accountable for them, all to admit how he truly feels in regard to the emotions that he's been bottling up and compartmentalizing for over half a decade. This proves to Kim that deep down, the Jimmy that she used to know from the mailroom is still there. As James sits down, he looks at Kim again, who this time gives him kind of a flat expression. She doesn't show disapproval, but then again, she doesn't really show approval either, considering everything that James just admitted to. As the scene ends, James sits there thinking thinking about the ramifications of what he just did, but before we can see the outcome of the hearing, we first get one final flashback, this time involving Chuck himself, which is a suitable transition considering what James just admitted to involving him. This Chuck flashback is most likely right before the first episode of the show, and features many callbacks to the earlier seasons, such as Jimmy getting Chuck's favorite apples, wanting to grab him the special newspaper that he likes, Chuck telling Jimmy to reimburse himself for the groceries, etc. This also indirectly gives us the conclusion to the time machine question given to us throughout the three cameo flashbacks of this episode, as Mike, Walt, and Chuck sort of act as Jimmy's three ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. This time, we see that Chuck physically has the H.G. Wells Time Machine book, which is also what seeing the book in 601 and 602 was brilliantly foreshadowing. This flashback features one of the only times that Chuck has rarely ever been willing to put his differences with Jimmy aside and actually speak to each other with the brotherly connection that they've depraved each other for so long. But of course, this is the one time that Jimmy isn't willing to have a heart-to-heart -heart with him when usually it's the exact opposite. I like how Jimmy and Chuck have so little in common that when Chuck wants to stop Jimmy to have an actual conversation, he has nothing to talk about, so he uses the excuse of wanting to make small talk about Jimmy's clients. It's kind of a sad yet relatable situation where you want to have a real conversation with someone, but you have nothing to connect over. I also like how since Jimmy's so used to Chuck looming over him, always belittling him and correcting him for everything he does wrong, he just assumes how that's what Chuck wants, when in reality, Chuck did want to have a genuine conversation with his brothers. That being said, once Jimmy starts dumping ice into Chuck's cooler, Chuck instinctively gives Jimmy a hard time, hoping that he didn't steal ice from a motel vending machine. Not only does this prove Jimmy right and what he just said about Chuck always giving him a hard time for doing things wrong, we also know that Chuck is correct in his assumption, as Jimmy admitted to Howard in Season 2 that he usually does steal ice from a motel vending machine for Chuck when Jimmy gave Howard Chuck's grocery list once Jimmy refused to go grocery shopping for Chuck any longer. Again, I've gone much more in depth during other videos I've done surrounding this scene and this episode in general in regard to all the hidden details, so broken record here, but those will also be linked to the description. I did a hidden details video for this episode, a video about how the multiple cameos in this episode work so well, all of discussing Chuck's relation to the episode more in my Saul's Worst Regret video that I just mentioned moments ago during the court scene. What I will say is how I'm happy to get one final Chuck scene in the series before it concludes, 
To be honest, I also kind of wanted a Howard flashback post-death while we're at it, but I'll gladly settle for just another Chuck cameo as I was doubtful of either actually happening. Apparently, this Chuck scene was thought of after Peter Gould had already finished writing the rest of the episode as he felt like something was missing. I definitely agree that if this Chuck flashback had never happened, it definitely would have felt like something about the series finale was missing, so I'm glad that Gould thought of it and decided to go along with it. Now, after the multiple Chuck cameos that we got in Season 4, Chuck's actor, Michael McKean, was worried that if they brought Chuck back too much, it would lessen the impact of his death. For this reason, we never saw Chuck during Season 5 or Season 6 until this point, since if they were ever going to do it again, this would be the time for it. It's really tragic how although Chuck is trying to extend an olive branch out to Jimmy, they always have the same conversation whenever they speak, never able to build on their lack of a brotherly bond. Whenever one feels sentimental, the other doesn't. Whenever one of them wants to stick together, the other one wants to push apart. It truly shows that although Chuck is usually blamed for their dysfunctional relationship, in reality, they're both equally to blame. I think this final Chuck scene portrays that incredibly well, and I'm glad it came to fruition. Since the Jimmy-Chuck dynamic is what caused me to fall in love with this show in the first place, I absolutely love how we got to see that dynamic one more time, no matter how brief it is. I used to be fully on board the hashtag FChuck bandwagon, but the more and more I've watched the show, the more and more I've learned to appreciate and love Chuck's character for what it is. Michael McKean's helped build the show to become what it is today, so it's extremely fitting to have him appear in the final episode as one final swan song to it all. Next up is probably the most split scene out of the episode, the bus scene. The scene seems like a you either love it or hate it scene, and to be honest, I can respect both sides of the argument. Although some may see it as cringe, I enjoy it for what it's worth, but that's just me. So James is on a prison bus on his way to ADX Montrose, which is the exact federal prison that he mentioned he didn't want to end up in back during the plea negotiations, but he only has himself to blame for ruining his cushiony plea deal. As he sits on the bus, his fellow prison inmates start recognizing him as Salt Goodman. At first he denies it, tries brushing it off and ignoring it, thinking that getting recognized is a bad thing, but then they all slowly start chanting Better Call Saul in an extremely catchy manner. The chant is definitely what divides the audience when they watch it, so now that some time has passed, let me know in the comments if you love it or hate it. I definitely love it and just fully embrace the Better Call Saul chant. It gives me a huge grin on my face every time I watch it, I just can't help it. In my opinion, it works perfectly the way the creators intended it to, as the inmates chanted due to it being Saul's catchphrase, while also obviously being a subtle fourth wall break, chanting the name of the actual show. Get the hell up, Saul! Saul! So James suitably gets a job in the prison kitchen, ironically baking bread in the same way that he'd bake Cinnabons, even down to the dough mixer being an exact parallel except this time having a cage around it symbolic of James now in prison. This works so well as James is essentially doing the same job that he did as Gene, except now he can live his life without the constant fear and paranoia of getting caught. He also feels more true to himself now that he's gotten all of his confessions off of his chest in court, opening up about what he's compartmentalized about for so many years. So in a way, working in the prison kitchen is an improvement compared to working at the Cinnabon, since although he's in prison, he ironically feels more free than when he actually was. Also, just as we thought, he's become quite the popular fella in prison, as his Salt Goodman persona allowed him to make friends with his fellow inmates, making prison not as scary or intimidating for him as it would be for others. James gets pulled aside due to having a visitor, which is revealed to be Kim, who used her expired bar license to pose as his lawyer. This shows that although Kim regrets everything she did in Albuquerque, she still has a bit of that spark in her, at least enough to con her way in to see him, even bringing cigarettes. I love how she greets him by calling him Jimmy, implying that she sees him as the same person that she once loved, all things considered. It's a great parallel to what she said to Jesse in the last episode in regard to not knowing him anymore as Saul. To be honest, this isn't the Kim Jean reunion that we all expected to see in the past handful of years, but it's probably the reunion that we deserve. As far as the iconic cigarette scene goes, let me just gush over it for a moment due to the obvious. After everything that's happened to these characters throughout the past 8 years or so of their lives, having a parallel the first episode in such a satisfying full circle moment, even down to using a remix to the same score by the brilliant Dave Porter, gives me shivers every time I hear it. I absolutely love how the score gives that skipping effect whenever they take the cigarette from each other, it's just such a perfect vibe.
The way that Kim repeats to Jimmy how he had them down to 7 years makes it seem like she's impressed with the way that he worked the system, but the fact that he ruined the deal to confess of all of his crimes is probably the only reason why they're truly able to appreciate it. Also, although it's faint, the ember on the end of the cigarette is slightly colored, implying how the sparks between them will always be the same no matter what happens to them. So much is said from this scene without actually needing the dialogue to say it, which is what makes it so incredibly powerful to me. It's just such a perfect bow to end off the show, but enough symbolism what is actually said between them. Well, Kim states how Jimmy now has an 86 year sentence, which is obviously wild. He went from life plus 190 years, to 30 years, to 7 years, and now to 86 years. Although I do love and appreciate James throwing it all away to confess to his sins in court and in front of Kim, I do share the frustration that many viewers had with the fact that James threw away his cushiony plea deal. That may just be the naive or ignorant side of me getting frustrated though, as I feel like it was the creator's intentions to make us feel frustrated about it. They wanted Jimmy to get a sentence that would potentially cost him the rest of his life behind bars, but they wanted him to have the agency to wind up with that potentially lifelong sentence himself. They did the perfect job showing that he still has some Saul in him and was able to work the system to his advantage, but ending the show with only a 7 year sentence would have been too light after everything that's realistically happened, as it'd make it feel like he got off practically scot free considering all the charges against him. If he just simply took the 7 year deal and that was that, he wouldn't have learned anything and he would have stayed as Saul. Him throwing away the plea deal in favor of his confessions is what was able to truly show that he's learned his lesson, along with him allowing to fully revert back from Saul to not only Jimmy, but to also see the light at the end of the tunnel as James. So they did the perfect compromise where he talked down his sentence to having a cushiony plea deal, but then threw it all away in order to give himself that final aspect of character development. He finally acknowledges everything that he's compartmentalized and bottled up throughout the years, which also reunites him with Kim in a way where she knows that he's still the man that she once loved. It's a perfect conclusion for the character, even if the idea of him throwing away those 7 years for 86 can get frustrating. It's perfectly acceptable to get frustrated at this outcome, but to get mad over it and dismiss the ending as bad because of it totally misses the mark that the creators were trying to hit. Most of the people who don't like the ending to this show don't like it for that reason, but they just leave it at that. They find it unrealistic and or unsatisfying as Jimmy essentially had the golden ticket but threw it away, which understandably frustrates them. The reason why I accept it is because not only do I realize that the creators did that on purpose for all the reasons I just mentioned, but I also acknowledge that they seemingly purposely wanted the viewers to be frustrated in him throwing it all away. That's what gives us the bittersweet ending that we've been looking for, his character development is now complete but at the expense of his freedom. As far as the creators go, it takes a certain level of genius to not give the fans what they're asking for, but to give them what they didn't know they wanted. We all wanted the bittersweet ending, we just didn't know how we were going to get there. So for those of you who are mad at Jimmy for getting 86 years after throwing away his 7 year plea deal, I completely understand where you're coming from and why you'd get mad at that, but to leave it at that and write it off as nothing more simply misses the deeper reasons why the creators did it in the first place. Jimmy purposely getting 86 years did initially leave a sour taste in my mouth, making me unsure about how I felt towards the finale as a whole. But that's kind of the point, it gets you thinking about these characters and why he did what he did in the end. The more I've been able to think about the ending in retrospect, the more I've been able to appreciate the creators for doing what they did, and allowing Jimmy to have that final bit of development that brings out the honest Jimmy side of him, but even more so as he evolves into a new version of himself, James, where he can own up to his actions and move on from them when he had previously been bottling it all up throughout the entire series. Jimmy's compartmentalization of everything from Chuck's death to Kim leaving him is why he said screw it and became Saul in the first place at the end of 609, but to be able to own up to his own actions and have that strength to admit everything that he's tried so hard not to think about over the years feels like it cures him of the problem that creating Saul Goodman originally and artificially tried to solve. He's happier having learned his lesson, even now being behind bars since everything is now off his chest and he's now able to move on from all of it when he was previously unable to process all the tragedy that had happened to him. He's happier than he would have still been in hiding, or still having everything balled up as Saul. In order for Jimmy's character development to become complete, he needed to essentially kill his Saul persona by solving the problem that created the Saul persona in the first place. The premise of the entire show has always been, what problem does becoming Saul Goodman solve? So the creators, well, created the answer to that throughout the entirety of the show, from Chuck to Kim as I just said. But now that he's become Saul, in order to complete his character arc, they still needed him to solve the problem in an honest way that gets rid of his need
need to be Saul any longer. I feel like I could have organized my whole thought process there in a more systematic way, but I hope I'm getting across the multiple points that I'm trying to make in regard to Jimmy throwing away his cushiony plea deal and why that makes sense, along with why I ultimately accept the outcome of his 86 year sentence, even though it can initially seem frustrating. Anyways, the cigarette scene ends with Jimmy saying to Kim, but with good behavior, who knows? Kim smiles at this, implying that it's just a joke, but in reality, Peter Gould has hinted at the fact that Kim may help Jimmy somehow shorten his sentence in the future. The final scene of the show depicts Jimmy watching Kim as she leaves ADX Montrose, and as Kim looks at him, he gives her the double barrel finger guns, which is now a running theme for the last three season finales. It started with Jimmy giving her the double pointers in the season 4 finale, evolved into Kim giving him the double finger guns in the season 5 finale, and now he returns fire to her with the season 6 finale. It's a great touch that I really like. As Kim walks away, she looks back at Jimmy one last time as she turns the corner, and the show ends once Jimmy is no longer in sight. Roll credits. The series finale gets a double S tier, and here's why. Originally, I was going to give it a single S tier due to the frustration that Jimmy throwing away his cushiony 7 year plea deal for 86 years brings. Although I love everything else about this episode, that frustration still originally stuck out to me like an eyesore. I understood why they did it, but I still couldn't help but feel off put by it. However, being able to lay out all my thoughts about it during this retrospective and work through them naturally has allowed me to process the ending in a way that I didn't feel willing to or ready to before. It's ironically helped me accept and properly really process the full intentions that the creator set out to accomplish with this ending. So to some extent, this retrospective has allowed me to appreciate the ending in a way that I never really did, as sort of a funny self-therapeutic method. With that in mind, if you were still hating on the ending due to it frustrating you, I hope that listening to my thoughts about it as I work out and air my grievances has helped you in a similar manner that it's helped me. In my opinion, having a climactic courtroom scene to conclude the main events of the show is extremely fitting for the show's identity, all things considered. Down to its core, Better Call Saul has always been heavily focused on courtroom drama due to the the main characters on the lawyer side of the show such as Jimmy, Chuck, Kim, Howard, etc. Due to this, of course it makes sense that the finale wouldn't focus on some sort of crazy action including gunfire and explosions with life or death stakes as that's not what this show was built on. It was built as an in-depth character study as Jimmy struggles with his career as a lawyer, swaying between which side of the law he's actually on. Some of the best moments of this show happens in a courtroom, with episode 305 being a perfect example of that as the chicanery episode is still widely regarded as many people's favorite and for good reason. Although this show does handle criminal drama well in regard to Mike, Gus, and the cartel, this story started with Jimmy and so it should end with Jimmy. So first off, I'd like to compare my original episode rankings for my season 6 reviews compared to how I've re-ranked them during this retrospective. They've actually mostly stayed more or less the same, with most of them just getting a bump up due to the double S tier rank. I definitely appreciate the way that this show has ended more and more over time, as I really do feel like it's stuck the landing. Alright, I've got the talking pillow now. Kind of crazy how almost every episode got at least an S tier, with 610 being the only A tier ranking, which is still good. Finally, here's my new rankings alongside the previous seasons, making this my updated and final full episode tier list for the entire series. Kind of wild to see all the episodes finally properly ranked all together, what do you think of my list? As I've said over and over during the final 6 episodes, I really think that the creators did a brilliant job giving this show two distinctive endings in a way by first concluding the 2004 era with episodes 607 to 609, and then concluding the 20 10 era with episodes 610 to 613. It's incredibly interesting the way that they decided to end the show, with them spreading the ending throughout the entire second half of the final season instead of just leaving it to the usual final episode or two. It's absolutely brilliant and it works really well in my opinion. I also love how the creators did such a good job implementing certain character cameos to not only further the current story being told in Better Call Saul, but to also elaborate on the characters that are being cameoed. The creators have always stated that they'd only do certain Breaking Bad cameos if they emphasize the current story of Better Call Saul in order to properly incorporate them into the show instead of just being blatant fan service, and in my opinion, the final Walt and Jesse scenes are perfect examples of that. Although we do finally see Walt and Jesse during the final three episodes of Better Call Saul, it isn't just blatant fan service. Better Call Saul has learned to stand on its own two feet throughout the years without relying on standing in Breaking Bad shadow, so due to this, the Walt and Jesse cameos become additions to the current Better Call Saul story at hand instead of a necessity. I discussed this a ton in my Walt and Jesse cameo theory videos leading up 
2 and during Better Call Saul Season 6, so apologies if I'm repeating myself to some of you, but I just wanted to highlight how well of a job I think the creators implemented the Walt and Jesse cameos into the final episodes, which can also be said in regard to the rest of the Breaking Bad cameos throughout Better Call Saul, such as Tuco or Hank for example. Also, apologies for constantly feeling the need to redirect you all to other videos that I've done on the show, but since I've been covering this show since Season 3, along with going so freaking in depth about it during Seasons 5 to 6, I wanted the retrospective to focus on talking points that are original to discussing the show in hindsight now that it's finished, instead of just saying what I've already said in previous videos verbatim. Although a lot of talking points do overlap, I hope I was able to bring something new to the table talking about the show in retrospect that I didn't do while covering the show during its initial airing. There's also many hidden details and deeper meanings to the show that it was nice being able to go through in its entirety again and give my overall thoughts in a way that was impossible before the show had concluded. And honestly, no matter how many times I rewatch the show, although there will always be the same hidden details in the forms of references, foreshadowing, or callbacks, I feel like there's always something new to say about it all just simply due to how masterfully the show is crafted as a whole to become the complete and satisfying package of entertainment that it turned out to be. I just love shows that have so much thought and care put into them where you notice new things every time you rewatch the show that you previously didn't notice or new perspectives on certain situations or characters compared to how you felt the last time you watched it such as how I feel about Chuck now compared to when I originally disliked him all those years ago, or even me changing the way that I feel about the finale where I can embrace and accept it more than I used to. Due to this, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul are shows I will return to time and time again as they do really feel like they have infinite replay value, which just goes to show how satisfying the shows are at paying off every story thread possible while giving an excellent ending overall. It's seemingly harder and harder for entertainment to stick the landing nowadays, that's something that the Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul crew has never had a problem with. Although I do have a few minor gripes with certain aspects of the ending, it still leagues ahead of the rest of the competition as far as TV shows or even movie trilogies go, at least in my opinion. Nothing's perfect, but Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad sure come as close to perfect as humanly possible, and that I can appreciate. Bravo to everyone who worked on this show, from the main creators, Peter, Vince, Tom, to the entire cast and crew. These shows will go down in history as some of the best TV shows of all time, and for good reason. I hope that the creators know how much these shows truly mean to us, as we simply don't deserve the quality content that they were able to put out throughout the years that they've been working within the Breaking Bad universe. So thank you all so much for sticking with me throughout this massively long retrospective series for Better Call Saul. Thank you to the creators for blessing us with such brilliant television, and Yes, to those who have been asking, I do plan on starting a full retrospective series for Breaking Bad as well in the future, so look out for that on the channel when the time comes. In the meantime, I'd appreciate a like on the video if you've enjoyed anything I've said today, let me know your own rankings in the comments below, and subscribe if you haven't already for more Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad content in the near future. But most importantly, I thank you all so much for watching, especially until the end of this monster of a video, and until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out!